This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. Hello and welcome to Body Count, a history of podcast where we gab about death and disaster through the ages, highlighting figures, single events, time periods, whatever it may be that resulted in someone, or as is usually the case, a lot of someone's dying out. You are okay with all that. I am your host, Jessica Manor, joined as always by my co-host, Cara DiMuzio. And tonight we have a guest, and I think everyone's going to be pretty excited about it because uh, we're going to be talking about something a little different, um, something we haven't ventured into too much at all. So would you like to introduce yourself, Thomas? Uh, sure, John Koto, my name is Thomas, and I'm the bloke behind the History of Altered or New Zealand podcast, um, which is very much does what it is on the tin. Uh, like many people you've had on this podcast before, um, I get absolutely zero imagination when it comes to naming my podcast. Uh, it's just <laughs> everyone else was doing, really. Um, so like many other podcasts, I cover the history of New Zealand from uh, before people arrived all the way up to, uh, it will be the year 2000, but currently we're still in the pre-European kind of Maori period. Um, however, we're going to completely ignore like that, all that stuff that happened like before in the 1800s. Don't worry about that. So actually, we are going to talk about the 1800s quite a bit. Um, before we get to the actual thing um, that we are going to be talking about, which um, I, I'm talking like like they don't know already. It's, it's going to be in the title, so like I'm sure that they'll, they've already figured out what we're talking about. Surprise. Um, yeah, surprise. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's why I'm here, because, um, of course, New Zealand was a big part of, or had a very interesting part to play in uh, World War One, in which uh, many, many, many people died. Um, and so this is going to be... Um, Initially, it is going to be it's going to be fine, um, but as we get further into it, um, it is going to get into some quite heavy stuff. Um, so yeah, Jessica you know. will cry. Jessica will. Oh, cry. It was, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty bad. I'll cry. Uh, so I'm going to get all my smart ass comments out early. I'm going to be having fun. Then you're going to split the script on me, and the next thing I know, I'm going to be crying. Just oh my god. So yeah. No. Well, and would you like to tell us where you got some of your research from? Uh, um, where you- the majority of the research came from, uh, this sounds really bad as a, as a historian. Uh, well, no, I'm not a historian. I should probably say that for starters, is I'm not a historian. Um, I am trained in the sciences. That is my background. I'm a zoology person. Um, so there's that. Um, also, for anyone, um, this may or may not be relevant to some of your audience, um, but I'm also Pākehā. I am a white man living in New Zealand. Um, I am born in New Zealand, but I am Pākehā, which for some people, we are going to be talking about um, Māori occasionally as well, the indigenous peoples of New Zealand, um, because I have an interest in that, and I think it's important to keep that part of the story in the wider story. It's not who we're going to be focusing on, um, but that, that is still an important part of the story. Um, so just for anyone who actually gives a shit about that kind of stuff, I'm not Māori, um, so you know, that's, that's something. But the primary, um, uh, well, I shouldn't say the primary source, not primary source, but the main source that I used was um, a book called uh, Man of Iron by Jock Venal, um, which is a book about the man that we're going to focus on, which is uh, Lieutenant Colonel William Malone. Um, and it's kind of a book all about his, his life and who he was and that kind of stuff. So that was the main one that I used, um, as well as supplementary stuff from um, Te Papa Te Tonga Wewa, I think I pronounced that correctly, um, which is the uh, National Museum of uh, New Zealand. Um, they have a big Gallipoli um, exhibit there at the moment. Um, I think it goes up until April this year, I think, um, which has got big uh, statues that were built by Weird Workshop, you know, the guys that did Lord of the Rings and Avatar and all sorts of other stuff. Um, they built them for um, this exhibit, um, which I've got some pictures of, actually. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm allowed to release them in the show notes, but I can show you, yeah. you guys here. Um, so you can get a, an idea of um, kind of what that is. But yeah, they, there's a big um, Gallipoli exhibit at the Papa that is all about, um, yeah, you know, it's got the... Um, Kind of shows you, takes you through the different uh, stages of the campaign and that kind of stuff. Um, and they got these, I really, really, really wanted to be able to like uh, somehow replicate it, but they got these really cool like 3D printed D type um, things of the uh, landscape of the uh, of Gallipoli. And then they put these like um, lights underneath it and they show you like where people were going and they narrate to you how parts of the battle happened and, and that kind of stuff. And so they'll say, oh, these guys that went up here and it'll show you this blue line that goes up the hills and says, you know, then they went to this position and it names the position and um, it's all made for. So it's like a little like hologram type thing that they show you. Um, and it's really good for knowing the topography of the, um, of the campaign, which is really, really important um, for why this whole thing ended up going the way that it did. Um, so yeah, so I really, I put it on Twitter. I was like, I really need a map of Gallipoli. Can anyone help? And this one guy goes, Aren't you in Wellington? You should go to the Papa and look at this thing. And I'm like, yeah, that's right, yes. That's exactly my problem, is I want someone like that, but of course the Papa won't let me borrow it. So. Are you expecting to be able to like, walk in? Well, I don't, I, to, to be fair to him, I, I hadn't really specified that I needed the map to be able to show to people. I just said I needed a map. Um, so it was a reasonable thing to say, but um, this was quite funny. It was like, yep, no, that's actually what my problem is. So. Meanwhile, my imagination is just that a cutaway of Thomas walking in and being like, I need this shit, I'm a podcaster, and just like arranging oh. to take it out. I just, I need this. No, he's Nick Cage in National Treasure. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> if someone is listening in the future, dear listener, please, please make a like Nicholas Cage meme with Thomas. With Thomas. That's, that's what I was going to say. This is request. This is a co-host request. So please do. <laughs> Some of my photoshop skills, yeah. Also, I want to uh, add. Kagan. You're going to have. Kagan can do that. You guys are going to have an amazing time listening to all this tonight. But also, I'm a little bit shamed because as DMs have been exchanged on this, I'm like, damn it, Thomas is going to come on my show and put in a lot more work than I do. Week after yeah, week. In, in, my defense, cover. in my defense, uh, I didn't realize until I listened to the Nancy Wake episodes that I was expected to be a uh, to be sitting in the vehicle, not being the vehicle, as it were. Um, I, I, I was like, normally when I get invited on the podcast, they're like, can you do all the work? Which is fine. Um, so I was like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, I'll come on a podcast and I'll do all the work. Um, and then I listened to the next week because I was like, uh-oh, um, I'm not sure I'll do all the work. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, no, I've, got, um, I've got a total of 34 pages of notes, um, which is still not finished. So, you know, um, there's a lot of information here. Um, but, yeah. So, it'll be a multi-parter. Should, should be right, yeah. It is going to be a multi-parter. It's going to have to be a multi-parter. Um, I'm just going to start the listeners out just know that for all of you that enjoy Nancy Wake, this is a multi-parter. So all of you that have said how much they love multi-parters, Thomas has got you. Yeah, sorry guys, I went to the overboard, um, so it's going to have to be a multi-parter. Um, but yeah, so hopefully, my, my philosophy is more information is better in general. And there's still a shitload of stuff I glossed over, um, because trying to keep it in a narrow focus. Because the other, the other interesting thing about this was you guys came to me and said we want to do a Gallipoli like, episode. And I, I remember going back to you guys and going, Gallipoli's quite big, um, can we, like, I think we should like, narrow the focus of it. Um, and just focus
so yeah, um, it should be it should be good. There's a lot of a lot of really interesting stuff in the Gallipoli campaign. Um, just, just so much. Um, but I've written like a buttload of notes just on his life before Gallipoli. Um, so you know, uh, so anyone who you know we went on that Nancy Wake episode, there was that like old two episodes where we didn't even talk about World War Two. Yeah, this is basically gonna be the same. Uh, before we even get to anything about Gallipoli or World War One. See, that's perfect because our listeners are used to that. You know, yeah, like, talking about play. Yeah. Play. What can I say? It was, <laughs> I did three episodes of Genghis Khan before we actually called him Genghis Khan. So yeah, no, I got it. Yeah, you find in the original Napoleon that it's that actually Genghis. Um, but it's this one. You and Dan Carlin. I tell you I'm what. Just, I'm just <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, this is a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> but without further ado, man, let's do it. I'm very excited for the things that you've got here. So cool. Um, I guess we'll start in usually the best place, which is the beginning, um, which is when he was born. So, he was, uh, so William George Malone, as he was known, was born in 1859 um, in Kent in uh, Britain. Um, but his family was actually of Irish descent, um, so he was actually Catholic um, instead of Protestant, as most people were in, in mainland Britain, um, which is sort of relevant, but not really. Um, it kind of comes up a few times in his life, but it's not super relevant, but I thought it was kind of notable. Um, and it is thought that Malone's grandfather migrated to England uh, due to the potato famine. The Irish potato famine, which is where all good um, Irish Kiwis come from. Um, if anyone is aware of Richard Henry, um, he, the reason that he came to New Zealand was also due to the potato famine as well. Um, and he was fluent in French due to his time being educated in France, and he also learned piano and developed a love for classical music. Um, so he was quite an educated kind of guy. Um, and interestingly enough, um, before we even get to Malone himself, his father was actually a chemical scientist involved in the early development of photography, um, and he would be um, acquainted with other prominent scientists of the day, such as uh, Faraday, of you know, Faraday Cage fame. Um, so that was kind of an interesting thing. Um, and his father here was you know, intelligent, as you would expect, um, and he had strong work ethic, work ethic and deep convictions on self-discipline and self-improvement, which is all things that he passed on to his son. And this is something that's going to come up again and again as we talk about Malone, is his deep, um, kind of, uh, you know, his core philosophy is self-discipline, self-improvement, um, working hard, that kind of stuff. Um, and his father died of, quote, exhaustion and acute melancholia, end quote, basically because he overworked and had severe depression. Um, though it is possible, yeah, it is, it is possible, though, that he may have had a brain tumor. Um, but, you know, this is... That, that'll do it to you. Yeah, it was like the 1860s, and you know, science and medical science in particular was not, you know, super advanced. You know, man drops dead. You know, well, yeah, he's dead, so it's not much else to see there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so unfortunately, his father's death left the family without any income, as you would expect, um, and they became very poor when they were in fact uh, begin with. They were actually doing pretty well for themselves, um, and this more or less forced Malone into a military career. And he did this for about two to three years before he decided to move to New Zealand, um, which is you know quite an arduous um, journey. Um, so that was when he was 21. He moved to Taranaki, which is on the west coast of the North Island uh, here in New Zealand. Um, and his older brother was actually already here. Um, because he was already uh, farming here. Um, basically, there was a whole bunch of land that had been uh, taken off local Māori, um, and the government was starting to hand it out to people and, and that kind of stuff. Um, or when I say people, I mean white people specifically. Um, and we aren't sure what he was doing here for the first eight months, uh, but when he arrived in New Plymouth, which is the major city in Taranaki, um, in March 1881, he had apparently tried to tip a sixpence uh, to the man who rode him and his luggage ashore from this big you know, sailing ship that you know, couldn't come in properly. And the man handed it back saying, quote, you'll be needing this, end quote. Um, and this was Malone's kind of first lesson in um, kind of what they call frontier rules, was you don't need to tip the service people, everyone is equal you know, in, in the colonies. It was a different... Uh, you know, it was a different kind of way of operating. You know, uh, Britain was very uh, classist, I guess you would say. Um, you know, really? Yeah, shocking. What? Color uh, me shot. <laughs> Uh, Britain had a, a certain way of doing things, and it was very rigid. Whereas out here in New Zealand, in the you know kind of the wild west, if you want to put it that way, it was very um, it's a very different kind of way of doing things because you're all out there surviving together effectively. And so by the time Malone had arrived in New Zealand, it actually been less than ten years since the New Zealand wars um, had concluded, um, which is one of the most major and defining conflicts in New Zealand's history. Um, which is a series of wars, I think, across about twenty-ish years um, of the Crown fighting against uh, local Māori um, and basically stealing all their land and taking their land off them and that kind of stuff in a very uh, systemic kind of way. Um, so most of the region had been. Um, Colonized, well, most of the Taranaki region had been colonized on the coast, and um, with the interior still being covered in very, very dense bush. Um, which for, uh, this has come up a few times, um, so I'm going to uh, clarify that bush, when we talk about it in New Zealand terms, is forest. Um, so we, we don't not a bush. women's forest. It's not a women's forest or anything like that. It's not, it's not root. It's um, here in New Zealand, we go, you're right there. She said. <laughs> yeah, I was, oh, I was taking a drink right when she said it, and then, like, you know, that it's the way she said it, just so tactfully, not a woman's forest. It's just it, like it's a romance novel. Right. Would body count if we didn't have it, you know? <laughs> So, yeah, so when I say bush, and it will come up a few times, when I say bush, I mean the forest or, you know, plus trees. Uh, not quite a jungle. Jungle's a bit different. Um, but yeah, it's a forest. So the interior of Taranaki is still covered in dense bush. Um, and actually, not long after he arrived, um, Malone joined probably one of the most famous Pākehā forces um, of the New Zealand wars, which is the Armed Constabulary, um, which is this weird kind of mix of not quite a police force, but not quite a military either. Um, so it's more... Yeah, kind of. Um, they, they operated like a uh, like a police force in some capacities, mm -hmm. but they also operated like a military in other capacities. Um, yeah, so it's this weird kind of mix of um, New Zealand didn't really need a dedicated military at the time in terms of trying to defend from outside uh, groups. Um, and, but it also it did need a police force, so it was kind of like, well, we're going to arm these guys with guns and stuff because they're the cops. Let's just give them some more guns so that they can fight the Māori, which is which is mostly what they were doing at the time, as they were um, one of the big forces in the New Zealand wars um, that were, were fighting Māori and that kind of stuff um, for the Crown. Uh, but it is also effectively New Zealand's first police force. Um, so it was yeah, kind of a paramilitary um, force. It was also used for um, doing other things like cutting roads, uh, making bridges and setting up phone lines. So they actually did like quite a wide range of things because um, you know, when you're on the frontier and you know, um, you know, everyone kind of has to do multiple jobs to just get the bloody thing running, basically. So that was that was kind of what they were doing. 
Um, and Malone was actually involved in quite a few conflicts with Māori at the time um, that continued due to um, stolen land taken during the New Zealand Wars. So even though the New Zealand Wars was, were over, um, Māori, of course, wanted their land back. Um, they still want their land back, in fact. Um, so they were, at the time, they were fighting wars to, to try and get it back, uh, generally not very successfully because of um, the organisation of the Crown and you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but it didn't mean that Malone was involved in a number of conflicts with them. Um, and for anyone playing at home who was vaguely familiar with New Zealand history and has started doing the numbers on the dates, this does mean that uh, Malone was involved in the invasion of the pacific, pacific settlement of Parihaka, um, which is what happened to me when I uh, read this. I mean, hang on. Look at the dates. I was like, this means that he would be around at the time of Parihaka, which wasn't Taranaki. And I had to go and look it up, and yes, it does look like that he was in Parihaka, which um, we, won't go in, we won't go into, um, because it's like a whole, it's like a whole thing. Um, but basically, the long and short of it is that Parihaka was a pacifist Maori settlement, um, that the Crown went in and did a massive massacre of basically everyone that was inside, or a lot of people that were inside the settlement. So it was a, like, a hugely devastating thing. That the, the Crown actually didn't apologise for it until, I believe, 2017 or 2018, I believe. Um, our current Prime Minister, in any case, was the one who apologised for it. Um, so it was, you know, it's something that has been quite... Uh, you know, quite painful and quite in the minds of the people that um, managed to escape um, Parihaka, or the descendants now, I should say. Um, so yes, Malone was involved in Parihaka, but um, how he felt about this at the time is not really something that has ever been recorded, because he was like 22 at the time, so you know, you don't think about that kind of stuff too much, to him it was probably just a job, um, but it is unlikely that he had sympathy towards Māori. Um, as we'll find later on, Malone was kind of racist, um, which was not unusual for someone, you know, a white person at the time. Um, so whether he was actively racist towards Māori, again, that's not sure, but he probably didn't feel bad about it, is the, is the crux of it. Um, especially when you consider that, probably in his mind, and in the minds of a lot of, um, of white people, uh, Māori were breaking the law um, in, in this regard. Parihaka to them was breaking the law, because they had occupied this land illegally um, when, it was, when it had been taken off them in the New Zealand wars. So they, they thought, yeah, that, that it was justified, basically. Um, but again, we don't know how Malone felt, but yeah. Um, so in April of 1882, he and his brother resigned from the constabulary, because uh, his brother was also in it as well, uh, to work on boats, ferrying people in cargo um, from ships to the shore, just like the man that he gave the sixpence to. And not long after that, uh, the rest of the Malone family came with them, uh, which was just their mother and his two sisters. Um, and by this time, as we talked about before, a lot of the bush um, that covered the interior of Taranaki had been cleared, um, so it had all been cut down um, and logged and done all sorts of burnt, um, is another way that they commonly did it as well. Um, so the Malone's bought a section of forest near a place called Stratford, um, on a scheme that allowed them to develop the land until they had enough money to buy it. So it was almost like a rent-to-own type situation. Um, they were allowed to basically live on land and work it and stuff and turn it into like a farm or whatever they were going to do with it, and then they got to, um, you know, once they built up enough capital, they gave that money to the government to officially purchase the land. Um, and they struggled for a few years, um, as the colony was actually gripped by a depression. Um, so that was pretty bad, um, until the advent of refrigeration and the freezing works and that kind of stuff. I don't know if you guys call it a freezing works. I don't know if that's, really, I don't know if that's a museum term. It's like a big, you know, it's, 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 I think it's like a, an abattoir, I think is what other people call it. You know, where you go, um, you know, you, you single the sheet there and they get killed and chopped up into meat, and then from there they get sent to various places. Not quite a butchery, it's like, it's like 50 butcheries in a factory. You know, like it's like, it's like factory butchery, you know. So it's like up in Sinclair's the jungle, basically, is what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah, it's a big, um, yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's a, yeah, it's like a factory that basically specializes in um, killing uh, farm animals, um, which is an interesting fact for New Zealand is um, all of our farm animals in modern New Zealand um, that are sent to freezing works are all killed um, with a knife across the throat um, facing Mecca, because one of our big trading partners is the Middle East, who, of course, for um, religious reasons, need all of their meat to be um, killed in that very specific fashion. So um, that's not history, but, you know, that's a fun fact for you. Uh, <laughs> So, so yeah, so that whole um, kind of advent of this you know, refrigeration was like a really big deal in New Zealand because it suddenly meant that we could send um, meat overseas, uh, in particular to Britain, which was a big trading partner at the time. Um, and it also allowed milk as well. Milk was the other really big one, um, the other big export. No, we're not going to get into that. Okay, we're not going to talk about the milk. Um, we're going to leave that there. We're going to leave that there. Oh, deep in history, we'll have some words with you. But we're not going to talk about the milk. We're not going to go deep into the milk tonight? We're not going to go deep into the milk. No, we're going to leave the milk where it is. Um, it's, it's not relevant to the story. <laughs> I feel like we better explain this, though, to the people who are unaware. Me and Demon History have a bit of a feud over the milk situation in both of our countries. I believe he is based in Canada. Canada. Um, yeah. And so in Canada, they have bagged milk. Um, you know, milk in, in what we would call a bladder. Um, I don't know what people call it, but <laughs> yeah, in a, in, a, in a squishy bag. Whereas us in New Zealand, we have them in plastic bottles. Um, and, and it's just, I don't understand the bagged milk situation. I don't understand why you do that. I don't understand. We had bagged milk. Actually. But what? Look, we're not going to get into it. Like, I'm not going to get into it. We've literally done an entire fucking episode on my hatred of bagged milk. <laughs> 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 the milk. The milk in glass bottles, I should say. At this point, they're in glass bottles. <laughs> To Britain specifically. Um, and so for the Malones, this really helped them grow the farm with other farmers in the area, um, you know, supporting their neighbours and that kind of stuff, being a really big kind of guiding principle of the family. Um, and as such, the Malones and um, his brother in particular were highly regarded um, in the local area. Um, so, you know, they were quite, quite important, um, you know, they were quite, actually quite well liked um, in the area as well. Um, and so in November of 1886, four years later, he married Eleanor Penn, um, which was a member of a prominent settler family full of editors and accountants and all sort of other boring things. Was it considered a good match at the time? Uh, it was, yeah. Um, you know, she was quite high up. Um, farmers, although... Um, I guess at the time you wouldn't call farmers, oh, sorry, today you wouldn't call farmers the aristocracy, but at the time kind of land-owning farmers were quite, you know, high up in the social hierarchy. Um, so, you know, it was considered pretty good. She came from a pretty pretty wealthy family. He was coming from a, um, a family that, at least if they didn't own the land yet, they would soon own the land um, and that kind of thing. So, you know, it was, um, Malone was probably a little bit lower on the, on the social ladder, but it was pretty negligible. And again, the, the social kind of uh, hierarchies and things in New Zealand compared to, say, Britain were so much more fluid. So it, it didn't really matter as much if it was like, yeah, there's a bit of like, the you know, difference or whatever there, who cares, close enough kind of thing. Um, and funnily enough, uh, William and Eleanor's nicknames were Willie and Ellie for each other, as well as, I think their mates also called them that as well, so that was kind of, that was a little funny, honestly. So, yeah, and they ended up having uh, five children together between 1888 and 1897. So, uh, as my mum would put it,
you know, uh, the whole thing in direction were quite well known for um, being involved in various plays and, and like productions and stuff in the local area. So they were like, yeah, real into it. Um, and Malone also enjoyed um, sports such as hockey, rugby, bowling, tennis, swimming, horse racing, homing pigeons, and he was even breeding deer. So yeah. that's an interesting side hobby. Like, uh, it, is, doing, a, it is interesting. Yeah, well, I don't think he was watching them. <laughs> I don't think they were. <laughs> that's, that's, that's an entirely different other hobby. Of um, the, the hobby you see a peak <laughs> behind a rock, just watching the deer. Oh. Yeah, I don't think the breeding the deer was the old. Um, yeah, I don't think it was part of it. <laughs> but um, the homing pigeon one makes a bit more sense when you. Um, uh, it's not, I haven't mentioned it as kind of yet, but he has this big kind of interest in military matters kind of later in his life. Mm, um, he really enjoys reading about it and, and doing it and that kind of stuff. So um, my suspicion is that Homing Pigeon is potentially part of that kind of that kind of war games interest that he has. War games mm. interest. Hmm. Warren, yes. if you're listening, you'll be very interested in this. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so yeah, so call out our listeners every now and then. So if they're sleeping on us, they have to hear. Come on, pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah, so he was, he was quite, you know, there was a whole bunch of things he was doing. Um, and not even, like, he was just doing a bunch of things, like, on his own, kind of, his hobbies and things. He was actually very involved in the community as well. So he was part of the local acclimatization society, um, which, uh, yeah, yeah. So I can see Kara's, like, about to, like, seriously start doing what that means. Don't worry, I know what it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the acclimatization society was um, a, uh, effectively, it was the, uh, for anyone who lives in New Zealand, it is the, uh, it is the local bodies that predate fishing game. Um, so the modern fishing game councils. Um, so it was effectively the people that were managing things like hunting, fishing, um, and kind of... Oh, so like DNR, basically, in the United States, Department of Natural... Kind of. Well, I was going to say more like fish and wildlife, uh, like forestry yeah, service, okay. like the yeah, a bit more like that. Yeah, they yeah, New Zealand has a weird split of who that kind of stuff belongs to, but yeah, that kind of that kind of realm. Um, and importantly, the colonization societies were um were their kind of part of the jurisdiction was what animals could be brought into New Zealand, what exotic animals could be brought into New Zealand. So you know, if you are vaguely familiar with New Zealand's wildlife, we have a lot of native and endemic species um, that are currently being quite heavily devastated by um species that are brought in from overseas, so things like rat stoats and possums and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and it was their job to look at what you were trying to bring in and whether it was okay. Um, which like on the face of it sounds really good until you realize that they were actually pretty blase about what was actually coming through and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so you know things like starlings were brought in, blackbirds, um, finches, goldfinches, um, yeah, rats, possibly well, rats were brought in on purpose to be fair, but stoats were brought in on purpose, possums were brought in on purpose, um, all sorts. So that was their job to approve or deny that kind of thing. Um, so Malone was part of that. Um, he was also uh, he also helped to release deer in Taranaki as part of being that as well, which was also pretty sounds pretty like bad. Follow up, which is hobby. Yeah, it was pretty <laughs> bad. Um, it's something that we're still dealing with. Uh, deer are still a pretty big uh, issue in terms of um, uh, eating native plants and um, outcompeting native birds and all that kind of stuff. Um, so there's that. Um, and by the time he went to war, he was the president vice president or committee member of over 20 sporting clubs in the area, along with several other community and church oh organizations. My God. So for anyone that watched Lizzie McGuire, he was the Gordo and Lizzie McGuire that showed up in like every single yearbook photo of activities that he did, is what it sounds like. Uh, yes, um, me being a man, I'm, I'm not, uh, Lizzie McGuire references are not a bit lost on me. Um, never really was my thing when I was a child, but uh, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> oh, I'm missing the reference because I'm old, so at least I'm going, oh, yeah. So the younger one thing. Yeah, it wasn't really my thing, but uh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> But yeah, he was, um, he was really involved. He also became uh, a justice of the peace as well. Um, and one such organization he had joined uh, was the Taranaki Hospital and Charitable Aid Board um, that provided assistance in the years before the wealthiest state to locals who were sick, poor, or who had been struck by disaster like fire. Um, so New Zealand, of course, quite famously, um, with the first Labour government, um, instituted social reforms that, um, you know, things like, uh, uh, we call it the dole in New Zealand, but you know, like the benefit and that kind of stuff. So in the years before that, there were these kind of groups that would kind of do that job instead. Um, the kind of interesting part, the reason I put it here, is because this um, aid that was provided to people who had been, you know, were basically down on their luck, um, this was not extended to Māori, um, a position that the board confirmed in 1889, saying they opposed, quote, relief and free medical aid to the natives, end quote. Mm. Um, so a theme, again, that is going to come up again and again, um, kind of throughout, because, yeah, that's just how it was at the time, is, you know, white people were not super keen on giving help to Māori who they generally thought were um, most often breaking the law. Um, and in the late 1890s, the family moved to New Plymouth and built a large house for themselves, which was actually the first of two very large houses that they built for themselves. Um, so the family was starting to get a bit more, kind of, you know, a bit more wealth and up and up and that kind of stuff, which was good for them. In the 1890s, between the farm, his family, and everything else going on, um, which there was a lot going on, like Malone running over a child with a horse, uh, bushfires, local government issues, land purchase issues, road and rail construction, etc. This is a whole bunch of stuff that was really, really interesting, but it was not super relevant, so I cut it out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not super relevant, but he did run over a horse with a child, and it was like a whole legal thing, and all this stuff. It's not going on. Well, while all this other shit was going on, um, he was actually studying law at night um, and was admitted as a solicitor in 1894, um, forming a local law firm with two other men in 1903 that turned into a thriving business with branches all across uh, Taranaki. Um, so not only was he a farmer, he was also a lawyer as well now. So he's gearing up to work himself to death like his father. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, himself. Okay. Legal things How for running over children in his spare time. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if, I don't know if learning, learning the law was uh, spurred on by the fact that he ran over a child. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, there was something that happened. Um, so yeah, there's a whole lot going on at the time, and in his spare time he was learning all about the law and trying to become a lawyer. Um, unfortunately, though, in the next year, 1895, uh, his wife Nellie died in childbirth, uh, with the child also not surviving, uh, which oh. was extremely sad for him because Malone is said to have taken the loss bravely, but one of his close friends wrote, "Quote: The iron entered his heart, and it would be a long time before he was his old self again." End quote. So it was very, very devastating for Malone, um, as he was, you know, as mentioned before, he, he did a lot of, you know, uh, dancing and singing and that kind of stuff. They were very clearly very, very close. Um, uh, despite this burden, though, he married again a year later to Nellie's quote unquote strikingly attractive live-in housekeeper Ida Withers. <laughs> Uh, of course. Yeah. Of, of course. course. Wow, she's really, I mean, I don't think she had anything to do with oh, her mistress' it, death. But... It's, um, it gets a little worse um, because Ida
yeah, yeah, apart from the ATF, everything was pretty pretty normal um, in terms of like the social kind of high, you know, hierarchy, distance or whatever. Um, you know, yeah, other than the fact that yeah, they were you know nearly two decades apart in age, um, it, this wasn't super unusual. Um, and, and there was the fact that widowers were encouraged to remarry, especially if they have family to take care of. This was the other thing that the government was very, very concerned about, is um, if you go, actually, if you go to Tapapa, they have this really cool exhibition where you can, they give you a bunch of buttons and they say, imagine you live in late 1800s Britain and you want to immigrate to New Zealand. Um, you know, push these buttons that say, are you of this age? Are you a male? Are you married or not married? Basically, all these different conditions and select these different things and see, based on this information, would you be allowed to come to New Zealand or would you get free passage to New Zealand? And this was one of the things was if you were a single woman, or if you were a man who was married, or if you were a single man with an unmarried sister, you got automatic passed to New Zealand because the government was obviously very concerned with trying to keep the population growing. They needed women, basically. They needed women. Yeah. They needed, 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 they and kind of the thing that was kind of a bit of a contentious point was actually the fact that she was of a lower social class, um, like quite substantially being the daughter, daughter of flower millers. Um, so it actually meant that she was never really accepted in kind of the Stratford community in particular. Um, and that was, that was kind of a weird thing. Again, the class restrictions weren't kind of, you know, they were a bit more fluid in, in uh, New Zealand as opposed to Britain. Um, and kind of wrapped up in this was the fact that people thought she had used her position in the household as um, the kind of housekeeper to kind of quote unquote hook Malone in into being her husband. Um, so there was this kind of, you know, very classic seductress, you know, element to it as well um, that we see throughout history. Um, and so- It's always the woman, right? Not the it's always, the, yeah, you know, it's, it's it's, it's never a, a thing is, is um, you know, the man wanting to get a bit, you know, he's, he's, he needs a bit of, bit, of, bit of love him, um, you know. And, but Kara, his friend said that he was obviously having a hard time with it. I mean, he waited a full year, uh, you know, like. <laughs> a full year. God. Yeah. So a full year. Yeah, but as we'll see, um, his relationship with Ida was very, um, did seem very genuine. So it, I don't think it was either. I don't think it was him being just a weird dude just trying to get some younger, some younger tail effectively. And I don't think it was her trying to, um, Try, you know, trying to worm her way into this upper class family um, by trying to get him to marry her. I believe it was more like a, you know, he's quite upset because his wife has just died that he was very close with. She is in the house and around, and so they probably confided in each other probably fairly often. Um, you know, and that just, sometimes that's just how it happens, you know. Um, and then, then I guess their relationship must have grown from there. So that's, I mean, that's, that's total just me guessing. That's, there's no evidence to suggest that. Um, but that's, that's the way we read between the lines. That, that's the way that it reads to me. Um, but, you know, it, it, you know, people don't gloss it. So that was kind of what people were thinking is that she had kind of, you know, tried to use her unique position in the household to, um, to yeah, rein him in and, and marry him, basically. And this, um, Kind of part of this was that she had quite a strange relationship with her stepkids. Um, and this, but yeah, there was a bit of conflicting accounts as to whether this was true. Some say she was having the relationship with her kids were great. Other people say, no, actually, the kids hated her, but we don't know. Um, but she apparently did keep in contact with them up until her death in 1946. So who knows, basically. Uh, but in general, um, the Malones were happy, healthy, and pretty well educated, um, which was all very much to their advantage. Um, and something else that we're going to gloss over as well is that Malone had a brief stint from 1906 to 1911 trying to become an MP, um, which is a member of parliament with the Liberal Party, in two separate elections, which was interesting because Malone wasn't a liberal. He actually voted uh, for the Conservative Party um, every time he was eligible to vote. So, but the thing was, the Conservative Party weren't interested in him. The Liberal Party were the ones that approached him and said, would you like to be an MP? And he thought, sure, the other guys aren't asking me. So, so yeah, so he had a crack at that. Um, but we won't talk about it too much um, because it's, it is interesting, but not super relevant because um, ultimately he was unsuccessful. Um, but it is worth mentioning that during the campaign, he did speak out against the, quote, native aristocracy, end quote, um, in the form of Māori that would exploit white settlers on land that they owned but couldn't use. Um, and as such, uh, he didn't want Māori to own more land uh, than they could use or needed. Um, so he was very much against that. Um, again, he's, I mean, yeah, I mean, at this point, he's explicitly racist. Um, there's no two ways about that. Um, so, yeah, so well, he's very much... he's speaking out in his own advantage, right? Like, yeah. he's, he's, you know, obviously he has a vested interest in how things run. Exactly. He's, I mean, he has a vested interest in, in uh, Maori having less land because that potentially means he can gain more land because he already owns some land that was confiscated from, from local Iwi local tribes. Um, so, you know, he's, he's, very, um, he's gone from kind of benefiting from the system um, in, a, in a sense that, like, he doesn't really care, but he benefits from the system to now actively being for the system, kind of, if you get what I mean. So, so yeah, so that was kind of a thing that he did. And after two defeats, he decided to sell his share of his legal practice, and then he moved his family back to Stratford, um, building another house there, which had seven bedrooms, stables, and a large garden. So, he was, yeah, he was um, doing very well for himself. Um, and to manage this, they employed a cook, two maids, and a cover nest for the kids, along with a gardener, and another person to look after their cows on their 25 hectare dairy farm. So, what does one call a cow, like someone that looks after cows? A, a cow, a cowman? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I was expecting a punchline, and I'm like, damn it. I, can't oh, I, I just I didn't have a name for it. So I just said another person to look after their cows. Because I was saying that from I'm like, what do you call a person that looks after cows? A, a cowboy. A cowboy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fuck. It was staring me in the face. <laughs> oh, no, I'm staring That's what we call him in Texas. But yeah, I don't know. It looks it, it like a very specific image, though, doesn't it? You know, like, it's not like the guy was there in his 10 gallon hat or whatever, and his boots and shit, and like, you know, he's like, right. You think I'm wandering into New Zealand looking like Gary Cooper in High Noon? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly what you're saying. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so they had a very large farm, was the, was the gist of it. Um, and here he started another smaller legal firm, uh, which also did quite well. Um, and as much as he enjoyed gardening and then walking five kilometers to his legal office, um, oh sorry, as such, he much enjoyed gardening, I should say, um, and then walking to his five kilometer, um, doing his five kilometer walk to his legal office, which is insane. He was doing that every day. Um, 
you know, overlaying dirt roads and stuff. However, his careers, hobbies, farm, and even his family has started to take a back seat compared to his interest in territorial soldiering and his study of the theory of war. So this was, suddenly became a big, well, not suddenly, but was a big part of his life. So after Pari Haka in 1881, Malone didn't have much to do with Taranaki's armed forces, even with the outbreak of the Boer War in 1899. So for those of you who don't know what the Boer War is, it is basically a um, war in South Africa between the British Crown and a group of people called the Boers. Um, it's, again, a whole thing in and of itself, but needless to say, New Zealand was mildly involved in it uh, because we were part of the British Empire. Um, and so he didn't actually volunteer, despite the fact having like interest and skills and all that kind of stuff. Like he was, you know, the kind, exactly the kind of person they would have needed. Um, but he had, you know, family duties, farming, and his legal practice and all that kind of stuff. So that's potentially why he didn't. Um, but the, the war does seem to have been kind of a catalyst for his rekindling of his interest in in all things military and war and that kind of stuff. Um, but partly only because the war came to him. Um, so he actually didn't actively seek out anything to do with this war. The war actually decided to come to him in the way of, in August of 1901, while the fervor for the war was actually at its height, Malone was met at the train station by some local businessmen who enlisted in Stratford Company of the 4th Battalion Wellington Taranaki Rifles. Um, I hope you guys are going to get used to that because we're going to be talking a lot of military companies and shit throughout the whole of this, uh, <laughs> of this whole thing. So um, it's going to get a little bit confusing, but I'll try, and, I'll try and make sure it's not too too muddy. But we are going to be mentioning a lot of different companies and that kind of stuff. Um, so these guys who had volunteered asked him to lead the company, um, to which Malone refused, basically saying he was too fucking busy. Um, and then the men spent quite a while trying to convince him, but he kept turning them down until they said, without him leading the company, there would be no Stratford Company. And it was at this point that he agreed, though he did warn them they would be in for, quote, a very strenuous time, end quote, in terms of training and discipline. He, oh. he Yeah, he intended to make the company the best one in the battalion. And by fuck is he going to make it happen? <laughs> this, not this company in particular, there's a few more changes before we get to the bit. But as we find, Malone, when it comes to training and discipline, is batshit fucking insane. Um, it is, my God, is this man just, like, the worst boss you've ever had. Um, he, he trains them to an insane point where his own men like actively hate him, and doctors are telling him you should stop doing this. Like, <laughs> it is, it is, I mean, you did tell him you don't, you know, he did say he didn't want it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, we'll get to that bit in a bit later though when you know the war actually starts happening. Um, and by the next month he was elected and officially commissioned as captain of Stratford Company. Um, now this is, for those of you who are listening very closely, we are going to talk about what that means by he was elected captain because that's a very interesting point. Um, so the company already had a bit of a history fighting in the New Zealand wars under a future premier of New Zealand. Um, I didn't write down which one it was, but it was one of them. Um, it must have not been a very important one. But it was the premier of New Zealand, um, which at the time was what we called uh, prime ministers. Basically, was the future leader of New Zealand. As such, the company, battalion, and really the whole New Zealand volunteer force as a whole was trained in bush fighting and counterinsurgency to combat internal threats. Because of course, the, the basically what I mean by this is mostly Maori. That's who they were trained to fight. Um, because Maori were in the bush, they were um, using kind of like guerrilla tactics and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's who they were trained to fight. Um, however, now the force was being turned towards external threats and defending New Zealand's ports and hinterlands from external invasion. Because of course, the ports, uh, being an island nation, are extremely important. Um, and the force was mostly made up of what you call higher status people, um, so white collar workers, tradesmen, and, or self employed farmers like Malone was. Although he was also a white collar worker at the same time because, again, he's kind of batshit insane. Um, yeah. A lawyer and a farmer? Like, anyway. So, he's a gentleman farmer. Oh, he really is. Um, and so, of course, the military offered status to those who had command or prestige for those who had political ambitions, like Malone. And despite this, the force was ill-equipped as the numbers of volunteers rose and fell based on what people perceived as threats outside New Zealand, along with discipline being a bit shit, generally. And office, officers not being very good at all either. Basically, just because it was, it was called a volunteer force, and it was exactly that. You could leave or enter virtually at will. Um, so it didn't, there was no real cohesiveness in the entire kind of New Zealand military at all. Um, and that's kind of actually ignoring the fact that the equipment was outdated, overused, uh, to nearly beyond repair, and in the case of some artillery, was actually unsafe to fire, um, which is not good. <laughs> oh, <laughs> God. So it was, it was a bit of a fucking shambles. Um, and a lot of this lay at the feet of how officers were commissioned. So instead of commanding officers choosing who would lead a unit, so you know a general saying, I'm going to make you a colonel of this particular unit because I think you're very good, or I like you, or whatever, it was actually the rank and file of the unit itself that would elect the leader. Um, so this meant that those who were popular with the men, as well as who had the wealth to maintain that position, tended to be the ones who got the jobs. So that's why Malone got the job, is because his men formally elected him leader, because they, they, they wanted him, basically. And that, of course, is not a good way to structure a military at all, for a number of different reasons. <laughs> so, yeah, this really ended up meaning that those who, sorry, as such, people who were poorer and in turn lower class didn't tend to become officers, despite the fact they possibly had the brains for it. Um, and this also meant that the officers felt an obligation to their electors, so their ability to discipline and control the unit was entirely based on the men's respect for the officer. So this basically meant that if you got elected by what was basically your mates, um, you wouldn't work them that hard. You know, you didn't want to train them too hard, you didn't want to punish them if they did something wrong because they were your mates and they elected you. And you know, they, you know, they thought you were a good bugger. So you didn't want to you didn't want to treat them too harshly. Again, a good military this does not make. Uh, so that's a big problem. <laughs> and so this was made worse by the fact that the volunteer forces were not subject to military law. They couldn't be called martial, they couldn't be, you know, you know they, they couldn't, none of that stuff mattered to them because it didn't apply. So that was a big problem as well. And it was actually really mostly by sheer luck that Malone, um, you know, ticked all those boxes of competence, wealth, and had respect um, amongst his men, um, which was good for them in, in, a, in a way. I mean, he worked really hard, so it wasn't good for them in that way. But, um, you know, he was a, you know, one of the few officers that was actually good at their job and actually well liked enough to be able to get the men to put him in that position. And but that's not to say that the entire military force was actually really bad. Um, there had been some recent changes. Um, for example, Malone and a lot of others had to pass an exam at the School of Military Instruction before they were commissioned. Um, so that was not something they had previously they had to do. You just had to get elected and that was it. Um, so there was like kind of a, kind of a, effectively like a, a passing bar that you had to get over before they would let you become a, become an officer. So that was good. Um, volunteer numbers had been cut and some units disbanded, which was good because generally the volunteer forces were a bit shit. Um, fortifications were built in countries, uh, in the country's ports, and the equipment of the soldiers was
Despite this, though, military advisors to the government said that it was not enough and that New Zealand would not be able to fight off an invasion. But the Liberal government didn't really care much, thinking that the Royal Navy would deter any foe. So That's a lot of faith. That is a shitload of faith in something that you had literally zero control over. Um, because the Royal Navy was controlled by Westminster, not Wellington. Or it might have been Auckland at this point, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, and I mean, communication time would take a damn long time to get there in those days. Yeah, exactly. So New Zealand was heavily reliant on the Royal Navy to protect it because they thought, well, the Royal, you know, Britain is this huge monster. They have this huge naval power that a lot of other countries fear. The benefit so, of being in an empire, and I put in quotes. In quotations. Heavy word quotations. Yeah. 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 Was, was, yeah, this big kind of net that was the Royal Navy. Um, however, after the end of the Boer War in 1902, the volunteer force had swelled to 17,000 men as, quote, unquote, imperial enthusiasm swept the country. So it was a whole big thing. And especially since New Zealand's lightly trained mountain troops uh, had been sent over to South Africa and had actually distinguished themselves quite well, um, causing the government to think that there was no need for reform, much to the chagrin of anyone who had actual military experience. So they were, the government was very complacent in uh, mostly our land forces. We didn't really have an aid or anything at the time um, because the Royal Navy was, was the, the main defense that they thought. However, the New Zealand government was about to get a massive wake-up call. And four years later, in 19, was it 1907, um, there was a destruction of a Russian fleet by the Japanese off the Korean coast. The Russo-Japanese War. The Russo-Japanese War. Yep. So that was, again, the whole thing that we're not going to cover, but in the, just off the Korean coast, um, a Russian fleet was destroyed by the Japanese. And for 50 years prior, Russian ambitions in the Pacific were seen as New Zealand's greatest security threat. And this event showed that there was someone new to watch, someone who had a much greater naval presence in the Pacific than Russia, and in some cases, even Britain. So Japan. Well. Japan, yep. And was, it was probably the most important aspect of this was that Japan was much, much closer to us than both Britain and Russia. So, yeah, yeah so they, they were a much bigger security threat in terms of potential for invasion. And so the highest levels of government were concerned that the Japanese would have expansionist ambitions to that of the world's current empires. And of course, this would be proven a few decades later and would lead to the very real possibility of fighting a foreign power on home turf. You know, in World War II, just jumping forward a bit, the main thing that New Zealand was worried about was Japan invading New Zealand. Um, at some point, they did manage to get as far as bombing Darwin in North, Northern Australia. Um, and so it was a very real possibility. And, and it's really, I found it really interesting that it was even, you know, 30 years prior, there was still this thought that J Japan may actually want to invade or try to invade. Um, it's just that they were 30 years too early think, in the thinking of this. Um, but going back to, to World War I, in 1907, Prime Minister Joseph Ward uh, warned the Colonial Conference in London of the potential expansionism of Japan and China. Um, it was a bit more racist than that, but that is the general gist of what he was trying to say. Um, <laughs> there was a few more colorful languages, and it was clearly racially charged and all that kind of stuff. But he was worried about Japan and China for their expansionist potential. Expansion. Well, and Japan at that point was a valid concern for many reasons. Yeah. Um, like I said, I'm not just defending the rhetoric, but given what we just discussed, I think it's a fair point from New Zealand's point of view, at least, Japan would be considered a threat. Exactly, absolutely. And as I said, they, they were to be proven right like, roughly 30 years later. Um, so the, the concern wasn't entirely. Well, well, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, spoiler alert, but yeah, Japan joined World War II potentially. You know, but yeah, it was, it, it, is a, it was a valid concern, um, even if it was somewhat racially charged in some aspects. Um, and so, and interestingly enough, Malone actually agreed with this position. He was also, as much as he was racist to the body, he was also racist towards Asians as well. Um, so, but in general, he also agreed with this um, assessment from a military standpoint as well. And so, as such, a concerted effort was made to upskill, upgrade, and generally increase New Zealand's preparedness for an invasion. And so Malone and his strategists participated in many training exercises to train up, basically, to get them to skill up and, and actually be ready for some actual fighting. Um, and this mostly involved defending ports from naval attack, is what they were doing. Um, and Malone was actually even singled out, singled out in one exercise for his efforts um, because he, was, um, he took a very active role in, in kind of leading his men and um, was actually very, very intelligent when it came to tactical um, kind of tactics, I guess I don't know what it's called. You know, he, was, he was very good at leading his men and telling them what to do and where to go and assessing the situation, the lie of the land, enemy positions, all that kind of good stuff. He was very, very good at that. Um, Despite all these kind of things, though, there was some change on the wind. Uh, due to some political stuff that is very boring and I won't get into, um, <laughs> there was a newly formed National Defence League, uh, which was kind of like a lobby group. Um, and it was actually secretly backed by the government's own military advisors, um, trying to undermine the government because they weren't listening to them. Um, hey, you mean people within the government would try to subvert? Yeah, so this is the interesting thing um, in the midst of uh, everything that is currently going on in the world right now. It's interesting to note that not listening to experts isn't necessarily restricted to just medicine and science. It was also apparently uh, includes the military and things in terms of science, <laughs> which I found quite interesting. So yeah, so the government's own military advisors were trying to undermine them, which resulted in the Defence Act of 1909 being passed, bringing in compulsory military training for the populace and abolishing the 50-year-old uh, volunteer force in favour of a new territorial force, which would be made up of about 20,000 men. This I mean, to be fair, not just having volunteers seems yep. like a smart thing, at least. Yep. Yeah, it was it was kind of this change into a more a slightly more professional military, you know, something that was a bit more actually capable of being able to do the job. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's, it's also funny you say that because that is where a lot of these people were getting these sorts of skills is the fact that they were like part of the scouts or they were part of Sorry, uh, so, yeah but they, you know, a lot of what, a lot of where that this was coming from a lot of these men were coming from backgrounds of being bush rangers and that kind of stuff you know so it was a lot of um a lot of those skills that the scouts teach you still laughing about the bush Kara? Like, the, bush, that... the idea of a bush ranger kind of got me too <laughs> that was really good <laughs> uh, <laughs> that sounds like a job in the porn industry a bush ranger <laughs> uh... <laughs> anyway Back to history. <laughs> so this meant that all 18 to 25 year old men would be required to serve in the territorials, um, as they were known, before they were being before they um, were transferred to the reserves for three years. Um, again, just give them some that military experience in case everything went tits up. Um, and old old units, along with their insignias and uniforms, uh, disappeared, and anyone outside the new age range uh, retired. And all, but in terms of Malone, all current officers were able to stay in their ranks, but the system of election was abolished. Thank fuck for that. Good, good. <laughs> good start. Can you yeah. imagine the people like they were electing? 
like i'm just picturing like a fraternity right and i was thinking of yeah. fraternity and then yeah. you're just like dude let's just have this guy because he knows how to throw a kegger you know what i mean that's like what i'm picturing happening in the yeah. volunteer forces basically. i was thinking like your entire your life may depend on your prom king kind of thing there yeah, oh, no. yeah it's like it's it's yeah it was a total like boys club as far as i can tell um yeah, because it's just like, yeah, you do some fun shit, you, you shoot some guns, um, you go out in the bush sometimes, and you just get pissed with your bugs, you know, and you pay for it because, you know, you're in the, you're in the military. So, yeah, so it was, it was kind of like that, um, as far as I can tell. Um, and a year after this, so at this point we're in like a 1908, if I'm 1910, sorry, as we were up to. Um, so 1910, Colonel Alexander Godley, along with a few others, would be invited from Britain to help reorganize the territorials. Anyone who's taking notes right now, write that name down, he's going to come up a lot. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, so Godley turned out to be uh, quite actually very, very helpful um, in turning uh, the, the territorials into an actual good fighting force because um, he was actually a talented trainer and administrator. Key point, though, he was a pretty shitty field commander. He's going to come up a lot later. <laughs> I wonder what could possibly go wrong. What could possibly go wrong? But he was, I, I, feel, I feel like I should stress, I am going to shit on Godley quite a lot as we go, but I, sh I feel like I should stress, he is actually quite a talented organizer and, and like a, you know, very good at the kind of home-based type stuff. He's just... Well, you're saying he's a good community organizer, but that doesn't yeah. translate necessarily into the military. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're good at doing the food drive, but you're not good at leading a charge. Yeah, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of skills that, that, you know, in terms of like, you know, you say food drive, there's a lot of skills that transfer over to that in the military in terms of organizing base camps and that kind of stuff. He was very good at that. He's not very good when push comes to shove, people are dying and getting shot, um, which of course is what is going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I just, I just want to, I just, I just want to stress that he's not, I'm going to shit on him a lot later on. So you want to give him this. You want I want to give him this one thing before I absolutely tear him apart later on. <laughs> Um, um, and so later the men he actually trained um, in Egypt, spoilers, but we're going to go to Egypt at some point, um, and later <laughs> they commanded and globally hated him immensely. So I wonder that. why. Exactly. Um, after four years, um, he managed to reorganize and transform the New Zealand army into an actual fighting force. And he was then, uh, he was also actually promoted to the rank of major general as well. Um, and during this time, Malone was also promoted up the chain, eventually reaching the rank of lieutenant colonel and becoming the honorary commanding officer of the 11th Regiment Taranaki, Taranaki Rifles. So that was good for him. He's also doing pretty well. Also during this time, tensions on the world stage were flaring up as Europe entered an arms race, Malone thinking that war was inevitable. To yeah. Pierre? Yep, well, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it happened, so, you know, uh, spoilers. Um, <laughs> no, it de escalated and there was just peace. It was, everything was fine and we all went home the end. <laughs> so, that would so, be a body count episode, no? Uh, uh, it'd, be, it'd be very boring. So, to prepare, he ensured he was in tip top shape. So, he marched five kilometers to work at the regulation rifle space of 140 paces per minute, um, which, I'll be honest, I was actually going to try that, um, but I didn't get around to it. Uh, but I assume it's quite fast. Uh, so, I just like the idea of you going to a gym, like, trying to, like, get that down. Yeah, I also wasn't sure how to measure it. That was my other problem. How do I measure if I'm doing 140 paces per minute? Do I like a clicker and just, like, you know, click the hot thing or something? I guess I can or something, but. Yeah, but I assume it's quite fast. Um, it sounds fast. 140 is a big number. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, but he was walking five k to work at a reasonable pace. Um, he also gave up smoking and drinking, and he started to sleep on a camp stretcher to accustom himself to hard living. Keeping in mind, he had a house with seven bedrooms that he could be what sleeping in. What the fuck in. is wrong with him? Yeah, I told him, he was batshit insane. This dude was fucking for real. Well, you know, I will at least credit this, credit where credit is due. At least he's, like, preparing himself, like, putting himself in the mindset. Yeah. Well, yeah, one of the things that again will kind of come up is that Malone was one of those kind of guys who would not instruct his men to do anything that he wouldn't expect himself to do. So I he's, that. that's yeah. nice, at least. Yeah, so he was very much like a, you know, if you guys go sleep in the shit and I've got to, you know, we've all got to be in all this together, I'm going to be down in the dark with you. Um, which is something to be very, very commended, I, I personally believe, is that he was very prepared to do anything that he told his men to do as well. It's just that oh, the problem was... willing to do almost anything. That's exactly. The issue. That was the issue, was that he was a grade above a lot of these soldiers. Now, these soldiers would, they come from many, many different backgrounds, and he made this military life, his life, you know, that this was his, his thing. And so he was, he found he was very prepared to do, you know, a whole lot of stuff that a lot of people wouldn't be in terms of just this was, uh, physicality. This was his call to duty, am I yeah. right? Yeah. Hey! <laughs> so, yeah. Basically. Um, we don't know, though, how Ida or any of his family felt about him sleeping in the stretcher, or any of the other things that he was doing. In his Dear office. diary, dad is doing this again. Why? Why? <laughs> yeah. So, dad yes. thinks there's a war on today. Yeah. So, okay, anyone, dad still thinks there's a war going on. <laughs> So it would be interesting to know what his family thought, but um, you know they weren't they weren't writing things down or anything like that, so we don't know. And his office started to fill with pictures from uh, camps, um, an old carbine rifle, an early model of a revolver, and a sword hung in the corner as well. Um, Your what diary, was... going crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what did you guys do on the weekend? Uh, we we went out and we shot some guns and we walked for ten k's and oh. <laughs> we had a sword, you know, just, yeah. just observe it. Yeah. And so one of his peers said, uh, quote, it was the office of a man who was a lawyer by profession and who was at heart a soldier, end quote. So again, this man was batshit and saying he was, he was all that. Economy. This. Yeah. The economy going on here. Yeah, definitely. Um, the other thing he was doing a lot of as well, um, in terms of he was keeping his body very healthy, but he's also keeping his mind very healthy as well. Um, he was actually reading a lot on the science and tactics of war, um, which was extremely unusual for an officer at the time. Um, officers didn't really care much for reading or learning anything about past wars. Um, however, Malone actually studied the major conflicts of the last 100 years, which included uh, the recent Boer War, um, as well as um, Wellington's campaigns in Portugal um, against Napoleon. Uh, sorry, Portugal and Spain against Napoleon, uh, as well as yeah, as well, okay, this is one for you guys, as well as of um, Ulysses Grant, Robert Lee, and Stonewall Jackson of the American Civil War, as well as many others. He was, he was really into reading about these people and how they were. How they you know, it's just a shame a lot of these tactics might be of much use in World War I, all things considered. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was it was less about um, the, the the things that he seemed to take away from it weren't necessarily like how to use uh, particular types of units or how to use um, uh, different types of technology like the guns and stuff. Because of course, the, the advent of the machine gun is one of the key uh, kind of technological advances that really changes World War One kind
and knowing where the enemy is and how well they're equipped and all this kind of stuff is extremely important. So yeah, so yeah, it is kind of interesting that fear tactics obviously wouldn't be terribly useful, but as far as I can tell, that's not what he seems to have gotten out of it, which is good for him and good for his yeah. life. He seems like a guy that no matter what he sets his mind to, he throws himself so deeply in it that it becomes what he lives and breathes. Whether it's being a solicitor, whether it's being, you know, now he's going to play war 24-7, but it's going to yeah. come in handy. Exactly, yeah. It was. It's interesting that this is just ending up being like this weird hobby that that one guy down the road has, you know, like, <laughs> like it's actually, like, it actually came in useful. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, but, you know, like, if no war ended up happening, he probably would have been that weird dude that likes to run around with his guns and instruct his kids to be a military unit or some shit. <laughs> Honestly, he would have he would have had some serious Peter the Third vibes in yeah. Russia. Just yeah. constant drill practicing, but no actual... Yeah, but as it turned out, there was going to be a war on, so actually, it's not been pretty good for us. Um, so, yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was, so, I'm going to ask it later at a more appropriate time. Okay, so one of the ones that he did um, really kind of study a lot, or paid particular attention to, was the Russo-Japanese War that had literally just happened, basically, mm-hmm. or five years prior, um, which was the first major military victory of an Asian power over a European one in modern times, as well as being the first war where entrenched positions defended the machine guns and artillery became very, very important, which, of course, is exactly what was going to happen in World War One. There's the exact tactics that they were using. Um, he was even making drawings of maps that he saw and taking notes of things from supply uh, from supply of food and ammo to camp organization. And I mean, like he was drawing maps and stuff. He was drawing maps of New Zealand. He was drawing maps of like Spain and Portugal and France when Wellington was oh, right. cruising around there and you know making notes on them as to yes, that was a good idea. No, that wasn't a good idea. Um, maybe he should have done this and all this kind of stuff, right? You no, know, honestly, that sounds like some Napoleon shit, though. Like mm. that sounds like what Napoleon was doing when he was writing all those yeah. years later. Like, yeah, this worked. Yeah. This didn't work. That, yeah. Doing this then? That's a little weird. Yeah, it's okay. a bit. It's a bit weird um, for a guy in his very large house. Uh, when, I guess like you know there was there was the war was probably going to happen at this point, so I guess maybe it wasn't that weird. But like you know, it's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> But I mean, it wasn't like he was playing like Total War or something. Like mm. this is not—he was a PC gamer. This is yeah. Crazy. I mean, he was—he was running these drills and going to these like camps and stuff. Um, you know, where they go camp out in the bush and do military exercises. You know, like every weekend and shit. Like you know, like this was the real deal. Um, so Can yeah. you imagine being those kids to go from being the bunch raps when mom was alive to now every weekend yeah. dad's dragging you out into the wilds, making you pretend to like play war? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we don't know if he got his kids involved. To be fair, but, right? Um, but... <laughs> I'd be inclined—I'd be, inclined, be inclined to say that the kids probably weren't getting, getting into it at some point. Um, so yeah, so he was deep in the goo of this this whole military thing and that kind of stuff. Um. And importantly, he wrote comments on the tactical effectiveness of night operations and surprise attacks, emphasizing the need for close cooperation between infantry and artillery. Again, something that will come in handy later on, because this is some of the key things that he starts pushing for when he gets to Gallipoli. Um, and overall, the main takeaways he got from his study was that brains and education were more important in winning than bravery or endurance. Um, he didn't really believe in kind of, I guess they say like individual heroism, but he definitely didn't think that if you, know, if you were just basically fearless and were really physically fit, that didn't really count for as much as if you, actually, you were actually quite intelligent and actually knew what you were doing. I would um, agree with that, though, because you can't rely on like a couple heroics to like, win the day. I mean, logically. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's, you know, it's kind of this thing where it's like, you know, a bullet doesn't matter whether you're really strong or really weak. It, it's going to kill you the same anyway. But being quite smart, maybe the difference between the bullet hits you or not. Um, so it was, it was kind of that whole kind of idea. And we do find later in Gallipoli that his men, some of his men were quite intelligent in knowing where to go, what to do without even his instruction. And that, that potentially saved their lives um, from, because Malone taught them how to do that stuff. Um, so he was, he was effectively proven in, to be correct later on. Um, and the, the kind of interesting part of this was that this was effectively the Prussian way of thinking about war at the time. Um, you know, that this was the way the Prussian military operated um, kind of around this era. And Malone also seemed to agree with the insights of General Sir Ian Hamilton, who professed not only the need for an officer to have a good eye, uh, or sorry, to have an eye for good ground, but to have a bit of imagination and rapid seizing of opportunities that officers should... Sorry, hang on. I wrote a really weird sentence there. Um, <laughs> so General Sir Ian Hamilton basically said you should have a good eye for ground, a bit of imagination, and be able to rapidly seize opportunities. But also that officers should have, quote, iron character that brushes all objections aside, an engaging personality, and a philosophy which enables him to be calm under any circumstance, end quote. That sounds pretty good. General Sir Ian Hamilton is going to come up a lot. Note that name down. <laughs> So, um, there's that. Um, well, at least he has, at least, you know, this is, he's got some sense going into it. At least sounds like a sensible human being, so. Yeah, again, some of these guys are, they, they are very good at very specific things. Um, and none of these <laughs> things are actual field commanding, which is really, yeah. really the kind of key point. So, well, yeah. So it's quite bad, because that's going to be really important. And so, with Malone's research, also came a new wave of kind of military doctrine from the uppermost echelons of the British military, focusing more on fire and advanced tactics than just firing in a line as they had been uh, doing, you know, since basically the advent of firearms. Um, and this was done along with a combined arms approach uh, of working with artillery and cavalry closely. So it's kind of this uh, change into um, you know what you'd see modern artillery, or even World War II, sorry, modern warfare, or even uh, World War II warfare was with kind of like blitzkrieg and that kind of stuff. Not just focusing on infantry um, and then using other kind of units separately, using the kind of war at the same time and in a cohesive kind of way to kind of overwhelm the enemy. Um, again, which is very important. Um, and this ended up kind of resulting in a totally reorganized British military, which was included New Zealand. Um, and in the camps during the first decade of the 20th century, Malone showed he had a knack for organization in solving the problems associated with large groups of people gathered in one area, taking a particular interest in sanitation, something that would serve him very well later. And well, hygiene, interesting. yeah, interesting. hygiene became something that he was known for. He was the guy who was very interested in where you were taking a dump, which ended up actually serving him very well. <laughs> so Yeah, but also, weird, you know, like, yeah. can you imagine having to be in charge of, like, watch where you're shitting. Yeah, like he was the positioning of like the latrines was very important to him. Where um the rubbish was being dumped, that was very important to him. Um, keeping his make sure the men were um, keeping nice and clean, uh, well fed, um, you know, with a variety of different foods. Um, and just you know, like generally, uh, that. that's good. I mean, like you said, that's going to be a huge benefit for obvious reasons later yeah. on. 
Yeah. He's no, taking, again, he's taking the interesting lessons from all this reading, just like you said. You know, disease yeah. is the number one killer. Not him. Not going to get yeah. him. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's, it's interesting that he seems to have taken the exactly correct like uh, lessons from all these people um, throughout history over the last one hundred years. Um, yeah, that's very, very well because of course, disease is a huge killer. Um, in, in not just war, but anytime you have large groups of people hanging around with each other. Um, so yeah, so that becomes like his kind of thing. The thing that he's really known for is the guy that actually like, actually cares if you take the shit, which is quite funny, but also <laughs> helpful. And so. After his intense, you know, uh, kind of rigorous training regime, Malone's men were actually likely some of the most disciplined soldiers in the entire army due to this you know, very strict um, uh, kind of training regime. Funnily enough, though, you could pick a Malone man in a lineup by his hat. So previously, um, these hats um, had a groove in the middle, um, kind of uh, it was kind of like a, a dip in the center line of the back, where the line went from the front of the hat to the back. Um, it's kind of like a cowboy hat a little bit. Um, it's it's mm -hmm. mostly associated with uh, like cavalry units. Um, so if anyone kind of thinks of like a, a kind of World War One cavalry unit hat, um, that's the kind of hat that was common across all of the New Zealand military, as well as others in the world as well. Um, but the, it was called slouch hat. There you go. It's called slouch hat. Um, but the problem with that was that it was very prone to getting very, very wet. Um, the, the water would actually sit in that little groove in the middle. So at one particularly wet camp in 1911, Malone tipped out the water that had collected at the top of his hat and then pressed it into a four-sided point to let the rain run off of it, which is the picture that I've just sent you now. This men thought that this was a great idea and followed suit, giving rise to the lemon squeezer hat on account of how it looked like a lemon squeezer, um, which is, yeah, really accurate. It looks exactly like a lemon squeezer. Um, and... And this actually ended up being a really, really good design feature. Um, and this was, again, one of the things that really defined uh, kind of Malone's men, is you could pick them out because they all had these pointy hats. Um, and however, well, kind of interestingly enough, by the end of the Gallipoli campaign a few years later, this would become standard for the Kiwi infantry. And it's actually still a part of a, as part, as an iconic part of New Zealand military dress today. We still have people today in formal military attire wearing that lemon squeezer hat. Um, and particularly things like, um, like Anzac Day is the, the big one. Well, Anzac Day is the, the day for Gallipoli. Okay, is it? Uh, that, half, it? Uh, no, it hasn't happened yet. Um, it, I mean, spoilers, but it is on the 25th of April is uh, Anzac Day, uh, because that is the spoilers day of the landings. Um, so, yeah, we're not there yet. You're jumping ahead. <laughs> no, no, I'm, just thinking, I'm just thinking, that's all. Yeah, so uh, that's definitely where a lot of people see the lemon squeezer hat, because that's where we often have uh, people with mili you know, formal military attire. But pretty much any mili formal military event, you will see people with a lemon squeezer hat. Um, and that was it's basically uh, kind of on a whim, instituted by Malone. Not even instituted by me, he didn't even push for people to do this. It was just a good idea that he had that people kind of copied. Um, and eventually became quite widespread within, within the New Zealand um, military. And by 1913, Malone's performance had been noticed by Godley, um, now the commander in chief of the New Zealand forces. So he was the uh, commandant of the entire New Zealand military, or the New Zealand army, I should say. And I mean, Godley uh, fucked it up. What could possibly <laughs> go wrong? Um, and he gained quite a lot of praise from Godley, actually. Um, though Godley it's himself admitted that he was initially drawn to Malone due to their similar Anglo Irish ancestry, along with, quote, his attractive personality and obvious keenness. This resulted in his full promotion to lieutenant colonel of the 11th Regiment Taranaki Rifles. I don't, I don't that sounds like a white nationalistic yeah. approach to promote somebody. It's a weird idea, yeah. Um, but yeah, it seems that he was initially into him because he, uh, they were just they were both white, basically. And they had pretty faces, probably to him. This is like a yeah. Napoleon style type of situation. Oh no. Yeah. So, but yeah, this did result in Malone being promoted um, fully to lieutenant colonel of his regiment. So that's quite exciting for him. Um, and it seems Malone's immediate superior and the CEO of the, of the commanding officer of the Wellington Military District also heaped on the praise to him as well. Um, and Malone would also later be invited uh, to dinner in New Plymouth with the Ministry of Defence, uh, Colonel James Allen, and the now General Godley and General Sir Ian Hamilton himself, who was actually over, over um, from Britain to assess the army and its readiness. Um, incidentally, he was most impressed, saying it was, quote, well equipped and well armed. The human material is second to none in the world, end quote. Um, which the main thing I gained from that is what a fucking disgusting way to reference people as human material. Um, <laughs> I felt, that, I felt that that was a horrible way to describe soldiers. And he's the only dead as well. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of, I mean, it, it speaks a lot to how, again, how how it's going to come up a lot. Yeah, it's, it's, it. yeah, it's how they view it. You can see later on how this is very much how we view everything in terms of like military and that kind of stuff. It was human material. So well, I can argue that's a, that's a whole thing throughout World War One, and not just on this particular side either. I mean, this is yeah. um, kind of a whole commanding officer situation where you have people that are trained um, that want to play things by the books, but that's, they do it at the expense of human lives. And when yeah. things don't go just according to plan, they still don't necessarily want to alter the plans because they're not particularly empathetic. And yeah. that's, oh, shit, you're right, though, when you think about... As unpleasant as human material is at least they didn't you know specifically say what they were thinking in cannon fodder um exactly that, you know, yeah yeah that's a, basically a euphemism for it it was, a, it was a polite way to say that exactly yeah absolutely because of course these guys didn't have many climbs about you know if they lost a couple of thousand men to gain 100 meters of ground to them that, that equation was, was favorable you know so it's, it's always it, the ends justify the means situation exactly thinking. yeah it's just i don't know there's quite a bit there has been and there will be quite a few quotes from these guys throughout but it's just that, that one in particular just kind of i don't know just when i read it for the first time i was like holy shit like these guys like the just, palace, yeah. yeah yeah it's just yeah, to me it was just, oh. Um, listeners that Kara, like, oh, what? what are, you are you telling us all that nationalism on a global stage can lead to dick measuring between countries and that maybe human life ceases to mean anything? Is that why that's bad? <laughs> why are those any current names? Question mark in front of you saying <laughs> <laughs> that way I don't feel so bad for hitting it on the nose and being an ass. Yeah. Under my imaginary voice by doing so. Okay, but what I was going to say is for any listeners out there that haven't watched My Keep Centipede or They Shall Not Grow Old, I would have to recommend both of them. They are both hard viewing in different ways. Um, they Shall Not Grow Old is more documentary, and it was actually done by Peter Jackson uh, with Imperial War Museum, put it awesome. in interviews. Um, and it gives you an idea of the training, particularly, as well as um, really gruesome things that are prevalent in World War One, since 1917. 1917 is something I wanted to mention because as Thomas was describing kind of the whole commanding officer situation, I'm just thinking of kind of one of the climactic scenes where they're trying to communicate. And they
Oh, we're gonna. This is this is gonna happen a lot. You're gonna have a bad oh. time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great. No, I don't think seventeen is really, really good. I really enjoyed that one. Um, one of the actually interesting things I did watch a clip about. Uh, we shall not grow old. There is I'm just going a bit of a tangent, but there is a. Yeah, there's um there's a bit where Peter Jackson was talking. Who's the director? Was talking about um how they found this clip of this guy uh, like this um uh, he was like a captain or something was speaking to his men just before they were about to go for an attack and he's reading off this piece of paper um and they didn't know what he was saying because he was a bit too far away from the camera for them to lip read because they needed someone to um to voice act what they were saying mm-hmm. yeah and so they couldn't figure out what he was saying for the voice actor to actually know what to say so they went and looked and they found the actual piece of paper that that guy was reading off was with his basically his little speech and they managed to um set that up with the voice actor and the guy on the screen which i thought was very That's amazing wild. Like, yeah. Crazy to me. yeah so that was i thought that was really really interesting um but yeah 1917 is really shit that was so good it's a good way of giving you an idea of like, especially if you like watch it. And I know obviously United States a lot of theaters are closed, but I got it was the last movie I saw before the COVID stuff. And um, if you see it in surround sound, it's particularly unsettling because, oh, yeah. or even anything with Dolby albums or whatever, because like the noises, and you, even if there's like one fifth of like, is it a way of that in real life? I would have just been a scary cat. I would have just been a perpetual shell shock, so to speak. Like, bro. Yeah. yeah. And they didn't have yeah. an identifier for that point. I mean, people knew of shell shock, right? Like, it had been written about in vague terminology before then, but what's particularly traumatic is just at this point, there's still kind of like, there's there's mutinies that will happen. There's situations where people don't understand if somebody's frozen. It's not because mm-hmm. they're a coward, it's because they literally cannot understand or process what's going on. And yeah. I don't know, it's, it's heartbreaking. I think 19 Central captured that very well um, in that movie. So again, any listeners that want to have like even a taste of World War One, I, I know this isn't particularly in sync with the campaign we're talking about, but it still gives you an idea for some of the undercurrent. Um, so it's a good point of reference, I think. Yeah, 1917 is on the Western Front, but you know, you still get this really good idea yeah. of like the, the trenches and um, you know, kind of how warfare was born and stuff, which was all across the board with, with World War One. So it's still, after listening to this and thinking, wow, I really want to kind of know more about this stuff, it's still a very good reference for kind of what was happening at Gallipoli. Um, it's just that the Western Front was just totally yeah, flat exactly. instead of what was going on in Gallipoli. But yeah, because I remember there's a really good bit where um, when they're entering the trench, because you know, the whole the part of the premise of the film is it's meant to be one big one like, shot, right? Shot, yeah, and I remember there's a really good bit where they show you, um, you know, he's going down into the trench and there's this like, kind of transition it's not like an actual transition but there's this like kind of vibe transition of when he's like out of the trench and then he's walking down into the trench and you know, there's all people around him, the walls are you know, up to his head and stuff and that kind of thing and it's just uh, for me it was really interesting because i thought like you know for most movies they just they go from the cut from him being outside the trench to cut to him being in the trench but it was interesting that they showed that kind of going transition and going into it which to me was like it's all right when they go over the yeah. trench right like that's yeah. kind of particular really right because you're just like the way they shot it there's a clip on youtube of how they shot that particular scene and it's just like oh yes i have seen that yeah it's, it's mind-blowing i'm like i think it's impressive even with today's standards to be able to recreate something like that mm-hmm. um but no for seriously any listeners it's a, it's a good it's watch i wish i Oh, go ahead. I was say, I watched it in January of 2020, and I remember coming out of the theater going, I know this is the first movie I've seen in 2020, but this is already my movie of the year. Um, you know, and of course, I only saw like four movies for the entire year. So, <laughs> so it was already a It was an accurate yeah. prediction. I thought it was a hasty four. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I said that was the last movie I saw in theaters, too, honestly. So, there we go. Yeah, well, I'm allowed back in theaters now, so I have actually been to see some. So, uh, but anyway, we won't get into that. Um, let's, let's, get, let's get back to World War One, New Zealand. Um, so, on the fifth of August, 1914, Britain officially declares war on Germany and her allies as part of a series of events that kicked off World War One. Um, which I, I, <laughs> we don't have to go into that. I feel, um, I feel like most people probably know that. Um, no, I, I will say the people that are here with us understand how that would happen. Yep, there, the man got shot, and then it was very complicated. Everyone was at war. Basically, yeah, basically entanglement, alliances precipitated in part due to an assassination, but it was really the entanglement of alliances and an ever-going arms race, which Thomas already hinted at. So there we go. It was a whole thing. It's not super relevant. The only relevant part is <laughs> the uh, basically. Um, so, of course, by extension, the dominions of Britain's empire also declared war, which, of course, included New Zealand. Uh, Prime Minister William Massey immediately offered to send troops to aid Britain, the first offer made by any dominion. Uh, it was accepted, and volunteers began to line up for the chance to fight. 14,000. Oh, like the gold yep. star student here. 14,000 in the first week of recruiting, um, which was, if you remember, um, was nearly, nearly as much as the entire volunteer force. Um, and, yeah, it was 7,000 prior to them yep. organizing it. So. It, was, it was a lot. We were keen. Um, it was some restrictions. Yeah, okay. we'll, get, we'll get into it in a little bit as to why. Um, there were some restrictions, such as age. You must have a military background. Um, you had to have served in its predecessor or in any other um, army in the empire. Um, so you had to have um, some sort of military experience, basically. Um, and no Boy Scouts here. No Boy Scouts here. You had to be an actual soldier at some point in your life. Um, and of course, men signed up for all sorts of reasons, um, you know, to, uh, because there was uh, like a financial incentive, there was a patriotic incentive, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but for the kind of top level, this wasn't just seen as the defense of our quite, quite kind of mother country. Um, you, you hear that a lot, you know, it's all about defense of the, you know, Britain and that kind of stuff. But it was also, there was also a selfish element on the defense of our home soil. So Britain's extensive naval power was seen as the major deterrent to anyone invading or attacking trade routes, which were the arteries of the New Zealand economy. Kind of as we mentioned before, a big part of the New Zealand economy is refrigeration from shipping meat and other products overseas. But people, you know, generally didn't want to attack little of New Zealand because Big Brother Britain was standing right there with a huge fucking bat, right? Like, um, hey oh, here we go. I've even made that reference. In yes. um, so no one wants to fuck with, seven, with a seven-year-old when his 18-year-old brother and his mates are keeping a close eye. The seven-year-old, though, had to give up. <laughs> but this was kind of the attitude was the seven-year-old had to give up his lollipop on occasion, and that is how Messi and his government viewed this offer. The price of being within Britain's wooden wall to keep countries like the growing power of Japan at bay. So this was really looked at it like yep. if we keep on the good side of Britain and volunteer people now, if, if shit hits the fan and Japan decides to get a little island happy, which yep, they, in the eventual long term does in fact happen, mm-hmm. um, their thought was the price was worth it because exactly. obviously Britain would come to, to their aid. Yeah, exactly. So it was, it was seen as the price of keeping Britain's navy protecting us. Otherwise, the you know, trade routes and that kind of stuff could potentially be attacked and, and then it
Yeah, primarily, effectively. Um, <laughs> but it was a big unit. Was that it? Is that what did it? <laughs> That's what got me. Big unit. Big units in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> uh, a team of big units. A team of big units. Yep. A whole expedition force of big units. Um, but before we get into Malone's response of what he was kind of doing for all this, um, I do want to talk quickly about what the Maori response was to World War One, um, because it is actually quite interesting. So Maori leaders at the time um, had a variety of reactions to whether they should enlist or not. Um, some were totally against it, um, such as the prophet Rua Kanana, who was a um, Maori kind of religious leader, um, as well as the Kingitanga, which is the Maori king and kind of his group of people, um, as well as various iwi, which is tribes, um, who had been at war with the crown and lost considerable amounts of land to them less than 50 years, 50 years prior. Again, things like Kalihaka, the New Zealand, well, the New Zealand Wars is chiefly what I'm talking about, um, and that kind of stuff. So it was very much within living memory that um, you know, that Maori had been at war with the very people who were asking them to fight for them. Um, well, not actually, as I mentioned before, as I mentioned in a minute, they actually the government wasn't asking them to fight for them. Um, but other famous uh, Maori, or so other um, kind of uh, people, such as the famous Maori politician Apeana Nata of Nati Pavo, uh, were in favor, favor of Maori enlistment. They were very, very keen for it. Um, but the kind of thing, the kind of weird thing about this is that there was a lot of pushback by Pakeha politicians, so white politicians, and even British ones in London, as they saw the conflict as a white man's war and didn't think it proper to involve any indigenous peoples, whether that be in New Zealand, Australia, or anywhere else that they had colonized across the globe, which is a that would be thought, ironic considering the contributions that'll be made by people. That's yeah, people, I don't know, in India. Yeah, I thought that was a very interesting stance to take because you would have thought that they'd be asking for anyone and everyone to sign up. Um, you know, they had no problems with killing Maori and other indigenous populations when they're on the opposite side of the gun, but they weren't very keen to have you know the white guys shoulder to shoulder with the Maori guys, even though it would actually be beneficial. So well, I actually, yeah, I can't tell because there's two ways I can see that being thought of, right? Like on one hand, I almost have like a thought of during the American Civil War, the hesitation for mm. um black or African American troops to be utilized in Union. Or or um the second thought there would be, do you think on some level there was kind of a psychological element to it? The prevailing the prevailing theme I seem to get when I looked into it was that it was a you know, this is a, a gentleman's war. This is a you know, this is what you know, they're not gentlemen, uh, they're beneath us. You know, they should not be involved in this because this is this is a war between upper class uh you know European powers. This is not oh, a war so in the mud against body. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's that kind of thing. But I do think that there perhaps was an element of, well, if we ask these people who have just been to war with to help us, they probably, A, won't, and B, if they do, they may actually work in the background, you know, like to subvert it, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So I suspect that, um, although that wasn't like a prevailing theme, I'd, I'd be surprised, or sorry, I wouldn't be surprised if that was kind of part of it, um, because, yeah, they, they were at war with some of these people within, within the last 50 years, so pretty much within living, or is within living memory. Um, so, yeah, so that was a big thing. Um, so they were actually pushing against it, but um, various people um, then pushed for it um, to, you know, they, they were pushing against it, the white government to, to do it. So Nata, again, very famous Maori politician, he was pushing for the, um, for the what would become the native contingent or the Maori contingent. So eventually they did release and they, they made a Maori contingent. Um, and what was kind really of interesting about this was Nata said that this was the kind of, quote, price of citizenship, end quote. Um, and many other Maori politicians and Maori leaders were saying this as well, was that the, if they go away and they fight and they distinguish themselves, then they will prove to the, to the Pākehā that they are worthy of their um, respect and the rights that they get, that kind of stuff. They thought that if they could prove themselves in war, that the European government you know would be able to would view them in a, in a much better light um that this basically it sure would not happen but this was the thinking at the time that makes me sad though right because they're assuming better people of them right like they're assuming that they're better and would acknowledge and appreciate things but alas i mean there was never how did it, this, you'll see this crop up throughout this war but regardless of the service of so many people within britain's empire think about how even to this day there's not true acknowledgement particularly like when you think of the sikhs um the various people throughout globally that served that aren't acknowledged just simply yeah. because they were the empire but they weren't written does that make sense like yeah definitely and that's something that comes up actually with the white new zealanders as well is that the british commanders view them as lower or not as capable as the british units oh hierarchy uh, of whiteness now yeah exactly so it's not even just like a you're white you're brown therefore you're lower it's you're not quite the same white that we are so you're lower as well I say, have been more like pleased of america like leaving britain than in this moment <laughs> <I would. laughs> like i'm like oh we're out since like 1783 man like yeah so yeah, there was this whole there was this whole thing going on as well. So it's um of course in, in terms of like you know uh, racism towards Mali was extremely different um to as opposed to the, like effectively classism towards New Zealand white New Zealanders by the British. But it was um you know it was there. That is, that is something that was a thing. Um but yeah eventually um the Mali contingent was formed um and it was actually um in some areas quite popular. The recruitment campaign in particular with uh, Nazi Pado, which is um a an Iwi, a tribe here on the east coast, um was so successful that they actually managed to have an entire company made of their own guys, um which was really cool for them. And uh, enlistment was also very successful in uh, in the Waikato with Nati Maniapoto, which is another iwi um, in another region here in New Zealand, just south of uh, Auckland um, in the North Island. Um, however, uh, the Māori contingent was initially relegated to a garrison position in New Zealand before uh, Sir Peter Buck or Te Rangi Heroa, um, who was again a very famous New Zealand uh, or a very famous Māori person in general for many different reasons, um, he managed to convince the government to let them go and fight. Um, and we'll, we'll mention the Māori contingent a few times throughout the, um, throughout the thing as well, because they do a couple of very important things as well. Um, but Malone, for his part, um, pretty quickly offered his services either at home or overseas. Um, and his offer was accepted almost immediately, and he was appointed commander of the Wellington Battalion of the brand new New Zealand Expeditionary Force. So this would become his, his uh, big unit uh, that, he would, <laughs> uh, that he would command. So the Wellington Battalion is, is what he is known for commanding. Um, and he was the oldest man in the battalion. He was potentially one of the oldest men um, serving on the front lines at 55 years old now. Um, so we really breezed through a lot of his early life, sort of. Um, but yeah, he was quite old at this point. Well, you know, older than a lot of the other people that were um, signing up. Um, but despite this, he was very fit and capable. He was described as being 1.8 meters tall, uh, which is six foot, um, and a solid, solid build at 72.6 kgs, which is 160 pounds. Um, that's, that's pretty healthy, actually, that's in those times. Yep. Um, which, by the way, um, pretty much all of the uh, the units that I'm going to use throughout this have been converted uh, for ease of, uh, ease of oh. reference, those of us that do not oh. use the system. And we are grateful. <laughs> I mean, 
uh, Americans appreciate you. Yeah, no, that's what that's, I'm going to do. That's just one of many, yeah. many so, ridiculous tills that we're going to die on. So we thank you. Yes. Yeah, well, I want to tell you what uh, he's CB2KG. So you don't know what it means. So, um, so I can probably. Oh, no, yeah. I yeah. appreciate it. I mean, even though the listeners can use Google, I mean, at least for ease of listening, it's, it's, it's a pleasant one to know. Yeah. Anyway, so there's a lot of things where I'll be talking about, like how far something is from something and that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm going to be using like, things like kilometers and meters and things a lot. Um, so the, the, the gravity of what we're going to talk about is going to be lost on you if I don't compare it. So, <laughs> um, so it's partially that as well. Um, but yeah, and at the same time, uh, three of his sons were actually old, eligible enough, old enough to, um, to well, sign up. Been, he would have been pretty old by this point, for, I yeah. mean, far older than they would have wanted for their ideal candidate, I suppose. Yeah, but he'd already proven himself, um, you know, in the, in the territorial forces. He was quite well known as being, you know, very, very good at all this stuff. And I presume, yeah, I mean. exactly, and I assume being the batshit guy that sleeps on a stretcher when his wife sleeps in the double bed. So, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so he was, you know, he, he may have been a bit older than what they were asking, but, you know, he, he was um, their ideal candidate, effectively, other than that. At the same time, three of his sons would also offer to join, two being in the same direction, uh, sent in the same direction as Malone, uh, except they went under the New Zealand Mounted Rifles Brigade. brigade. Um, so they didn't join um, the Wellingtons or the infantry. They joined a cavalry unit instead, which would be sent to, be sent to Gallipoli eventually. Oh, uh, no. Yeah, no. the other was sent on a mission to seize German Samoa. So not long after Britain declared war, um, a unit was put together um, to seize Samoa um, because Samoa was currently under German control um it was colonized by germany um so we basically ran over there captured it very easily and that was that um german samoa would then be eventually given to new zealand uh by the league of nations um when the treaty of Versailles was being written up that was our bit that we got um and so samoa was controlled by new zealand up until i think about the 70s um when they we gave them independence um and then that that resulted in the modern samoa you see today um so yeah, which um, the there's a whole thing with that as well. We gave them smallpox, I believe, accidentally, um, and all this stuff. It was a whole thing. Um, Sounds yeah. like a white person thing to do. Yeah, it wasn't super good. It wasn't a great relationship all of the time. Um, but nevertheless, that was something that happened. So that's why we went and grabbed Samoa, and that's why we ended up getting Samoa uh, at the end of the at the end of the war. Um, so Malone uh, noted that his men came from all walks of life. Um, again, they were farmers, teachers, tradesmen, scholars, musicians, mechanics, all sorts of different people were, um, you know, had joined the Wellington Battalion. Um, the upper crust, or at least the middle upper crust um, of New Zealand society would be standing in the trenches um, the same as their fellows from, you know, lower down. So he was, he found that quite interesting was that, you know, there was this upper middle class group where, um, you know, effectively going to be doing exactly the same thing as the as the people who were, you know, the farmhands and that kind of stuff. Um, so the Wellington Battalion was just over 1,000 men strong and based on four existing companies, which was the 7th Wellington West Coast, the 9th Hawke's Bay, the 17th Ruahine, and Malone's own 11th Taranaki Rifles. Um, so they had all been combined together because if, if you're not familiar with how uh, military units are made up. Uh, four companies make a battalion, and then from those companies, I think you have platoons, and then from platoons you have teams or something, whatever. There was four companies, and what which made up the Wellington Battalion. And as was his way, the Lieutenant Colonel was determined to make the battalion the best in the New Zealand Infantry Brigade. Um, and he needed to bring them all to the same level because some were veterans of the Boer War um, and others had no experience or very little experience at all. Um, so Malone instituted strict regimens and discipline. Men were to march at <laughs> regulation pace, not walk when off duty, and dress standards would be strictly enforced at all times. Um, no missing buttons, basically. No, no missing <laughs> buttons. You had to walk at regulation pace even when you're off the job. Um, it was, yeah, yeah. This is his, like, batshit insane stuff coming in. Um, those who broke the rules would be excluded from final selection to go overseas. Malone didn't want anyone who would be a liability. Um, he, did, you know, he didn't want anyone that was going to drag their feet or anything like that. He only wanted people that were going to pull their weight. Um, and... <laughs> And Malone trained his men really hard, and initially they hated him for it, with one of his officers saying, quote, they at first disliked him, but later learned to respect him, and finally came to love him for a man that could be relied on, although they knew he was determined to try out every man who came under him and remove soft, spot, soft spots from them. 
he knew war would be a hard business and made up his mind that the regiment would be would be fit when it had to take its part end quote so he was the the kind of thing about him was that his men really really didn't like him because he was he was cracking the whip on these guys he was really thrashing them but he was one of the very very few people that understood or even had any kind of inkling what was about to happen. And he knew that if some hardship now could very much save the lives of these men, um, which is actually what ended up happening. Um, so although he was very harsh, it was very, very important that he did this. Um, and after some months of training, the whole force was farewelled to a big ceremony in Wellington on the 25th of September. So though Malone was a bit annoyed at all the pageantry, he was impressed with the look and demeanour of his men. Um, he wasn't into the generally into big extravagant things or anything like that. Um, this was actually a bit of a false start, though. A German naval squadron was spotted nearby, and the Australians warned Massey, the Prime Minister, that if the convoy left now with its minimal escort, it would be in serious danger. As such, the departure was delayed by three weeks and Wellington became somewhat of a garrison. Um, I should say that when I say Wellington, I mean the city, not the battalion. Um, as the men, equipment and animals all had to disembark from their ships. Um, they continued to train, with some of Malone's harshest training being done during this period, uh, making them climb the steep slopes of Tenakori Hill, um, which is actually a hill, it's, it's a hill in Wellington, um, I have seen it, I have not yet walked up it, um, but I've talked to a few people that have walked up it, and they say it's really fucking steep and really shit, um, so... <laughs> oh, no wonder you're not so eager to go. No, I do want to try it, endeavor. but apparently they really did not like him for it. Um, but generally the men's conduct was reported to be good around town, uh, because no one wanted to be left behind. Um, now that they were Fair. effectively on the precipice of leaving for Europe. Um, because the other thing that I should stress as well is that these guys thought that they were going to the Western Front. That's where they were being told that they were going to be deployed. Um, the training was worth it, though, with multiple high-ranking officers saying the Wellingtons were the best battalion in the brigade. Nice one. Um, and by the 14th of October, the new escort arrived and was ready to take them to Australia and then on to Europe. Something that we're going to talk a lot about is how Malone actually was quite pro, uh, prolific in writing letters to his wife um, when he was overseas and that kind of stuff. Um, so one of the ones he wrote to his wife at this period was, quote, you are a brave woman and I know you will bear yourself as a brave woman. You know that it is a duty calls to me that I am leaving you and home and that I am in God's good hands and will be as safe abroad as at home. Teach the children of doctrine of work and duty duty to themselves, their fellows, and above all, their country, end quote. Why, why does it sound like he's just accepted his fate completely? Quite. Yeah, so th we'll talk about this in a, in, a, in a bit, but it does seem interesting that he was outwardly facing very uh, hopeful to his wife and even to his men that he was going to come home. Um, it does seem, though, in his private correspondence, like in his diary and stuff, he did somehow seem to know that he was not going to come back, um, which was very interesting. Um, I don't know if it was just because he had one of those weird kind of, kind of, you know, like spiritual gut feelings or whether it was a, just he was just like, statistically, I'm not going to survive. Like, you know, the numbers just don't add up. I'm statistically just probably not going to survive. Um, but yeah, he does seem to have this inkling that he is not going to come back. Um, so yeah, which is really, I found really interesting. Um, but before Malone left though, one of the kind of cool, well, not really cool, but one of kind of the interesting things was he observed Japanese officers from a docked heavy cruiser buying maps of New Zealand in a bookshop. And Malone assumed this was for intelligence reasons and wrote, quote, I suppose we shall be at war with them within 10 years, end quote. Um, which is, that's an interesting thing to notice. <laughs> it is an interesting thing to note. And even if it wasn't 10 years, it sure wasn't that far. You know what I mean? Yeah. Far removed, really. Yeah. And the other, the other weird thing he writes about as well um, is that he actually admired 
uh, or at least from what he knew of the Japanese, he admired them, calling them, quote, industrious, brave, and clean, end quote, among other positive things. Well, I mean, so, um, like the utmost of compliments for Mr. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a weird, like, um, uh, veiled, like, kind of, uh, like, insult, right? Like, he says they're clean, like a, wow, I didn't expect these Asian people to be clean, you know, like, kind of thing. So, at least that that's how it reads to me. Yeah. Um, it's, it's it's like a, he's surprised that these are like actual people capable of doing actual things. Um so yeah, but in general he actually was pretty racist towards Asians as far as I can tell. Um and in kind of typical Malone fashion, he planned his departure very meticulously. Um he leased his farm uh, left his law clerk in charge of his firm and prepared a new will, uh, leaving Ida seven hundred and fifty pounds um, in salary should he uh, die, um, which is about ninety thousand New Zealand dollars today, um, which would be about a hundred and twenty-five US, I believe, ish. Um, so, you know, quite a su- substantial sum. Um, That isn't to say he regretted his choice. In fact, he felt he had done well with his life so far, both professionally and with his family, but he wanted kind of more out of his life and he felt that this was the way to do it, Um, seeing this as a duty to save the motherland of Britain. Um, He kind of, yeah, he in a way kind of felt that the, he was very successful in his endeavors in New Zealand and, you know, like he kind of, he felt he had finished his work in New Zealand in a way. And that he didn't really feel like there was anything for him to do here. He had succeeded in his life ambitions in New Zealand and going overseas to a war was a way that he could do something more and that kind of stuff, Um, which is a bit of a interesting kind of way to think of it. Um, So on the 15th of October, the small fleet left with a lot of fanfare. Uh, Malone believed that, if, that they were basically going to be back by Christmas, as many promised, promised then uh, it would be due to the efficiency of the German war machine destroying the empire. Um, he actually didn't think that they could win um, in a quick manner, like many of the you know the top guys were were um, telling them that they would. But he believed that if the war dragged on, British resilience would win out. Um, that you know basically he just he just thought you know like the the British kind of um, you know, uh, blitz battle of Britain type attitude was the kind of way to go was if we all just band together and just tough it out, we'll win eventually. Um, again, an interesting standpoint to have. Um, and of I'm himself, not sure I would have wanted people that I was serving under feeling that way. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's a strange th- way to think that be like, it's better that we extend this out by years rather than, oh, let's just finish it in six months and go home. Um, but yeah. Um, and kind of of himself during this time, he wrote, quote, this life suits me, mind and body. It is a man's life. I wonder if I shall come back or leave my bones in Europe, but I am content. I am in God's hands and no death can be better, end quote. Oh my God, if he wanted to die, he wanted to die in war. Yeah, exactly. Um, Despite this and his assurances to Ida that he would be fine, it seems that Malone knew his fate, also writing, quote, something tells me I shan't come back here, that I will go out, end quote. The kind of interesting thing about these quotes is that Malone would neither return to New Zealand or leave his bones in Europe. Uh, God, or maybe it was Allah, seems to have had other plans. Well, now that Thomas has left us on a massive cliffhanger, um, which again, I think all of our listeners are going to massively appreciate. They're used to that kind of stuff out of us. Everybody was just ready to get into the story and we've got so much more to go. That being said, Thomas, we very much appreciate you coming on, doing the immense amount of work that you have done, which is just staggering when you look at it all. Uh, and then, you know, we, we want to make sure people go find, follow, and listen to your excellent podcast. So where do people listen? Where do they follow you? All of that jazz. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, first off, thank you very much for, for having me on. It's always good to come on other podcasts and talk about New Zealand um, because if, if there's anything us Kiwis like more, most, it's um, talking about ourselves uh, and that kind of stuff. So um, thank you very well, you much for having me on. Well, you get left off maps, to be fair. We do get left so. off maps quite often, yes. So um, so it is cool to be able to let people know that we're actually here and we actually did some stuff that's you know actually interesting. Um, but yeah, if people do want to... Uh, watch me um, or listen to me. Sorry, you don't watch me because it's an audio format. Um, I'm at the History of Aotearoa New Zealand podcast. Aotearoa spelled A O T E A R O A. Um, as, as I said, kind of at the top of the episode, um, you know, we cover um, all things New Zealand history from the before New Zealand was colonized by people all the way up to the year 2000. And at the moment, we're talking about, um, you know, pre-European Māori. And we also have a lot of um, Māori stories as well. So things like Maui and the Sun and that kind of stuff, um, which I put music on and all that kind of thing as well. Um, so it's very a very typical history podcast, if you want to call it that, um, as well. Um, but if you're interested in hearing all the dumb shit that I have have to say uh, outside of the podcast, you can find me on Twitter, um, which is History Aotearoa, or you can find me on Instagram. Uh, again, that's History of, I think it's just History of Aotearoa New Zealand podcast. Um, I post lots of pictures of the bush, um, not, not, not that kind of bush. Spoiler no. alert, it's Instagram. It's Instagram friendly so it's, it's instagram friendly bush no it's a lot of a lot of new zealand wildlife type things as i said i'm i'm uh i'm a i work in conservation and stuff so i do i do some things with conservation so it's a lot of pictures of animals and um you know nice new zealand landscapes and that kind of stuff um of course you can find and me on penguins. facebook and penguins yeah no there's no penguins on instagram yet but there will be um potentially there will be because uh, you used to take care of penguins i used to look after penguins yes um, yeah, you can find me on Facebook as well, which is History of Aotearoa New Zealand podcast. Um, and yeah, and of course, if you want to listen to the podcast itself, you can find me basically anywhere you get podcasts. I mean, like, you know, if you're listening to this, you sure as shit know where to find them. So just, just, just Google <laughs> exactly. it. Man. Just Google it. Just part. Google what is a podcast, okay? What is it? It's a Google got, copter. If you got to the end of this episode and you still don't know how to search podcasts, like I don't know what you're doing here. Like I'm almost but, impressed if that's what somebody stumbles upon though. Like yeah. that <laughs> kind of like bullshittery, like shit. Yeah. So um yeah, I think that's most of where I live. Um excellent. Awesome. That being said, Kara, you know your whole spiel. Where to find you? <laughs> okay, you can find me on Twitter, primarily Cara DiDemizio. You can find me on Instagram, Cara.DiDemizio. You can also find Time Travel Talks on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, um, which is pretty easy to follow. Um, if you have listened to any episodes where I've been on, you will know the whole spiel. But the gist is it's a community of people that are interested in history that may not be historians, but that may find certain things interesting and want to talk about with other like-minded people. Um, we have a nice community. Um, we are changing the format of a lot of things. So by the point this comes out, there may be more to say. So that's why I'm being a little subtle here. Um, but if anyone has any questions on that, um, I, I am primarily, sorry, Leah, but I'm the one that runs the Time Travel Talks Twitter. So it's me. Uh, yeah. It, it honestly is me, um, 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, although I will say Leah is on Instagram for time travel talks 99% of the time. So <laughs> I'm not a fan of that particular platform. Um, but yes. And then Jessica, we can find you at Jessica B Manor on Twitter, I believe. And <laughs> Bra Jessica B is in Bravo spelled like the house and not the behavior. We all know that, but Jessica B Manor on Twitter and Instagram. Of course you can follow the show at body count pod, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, body count history pod.com. You guys know the drill. Yes, Kara. I also wanted to add, I think Thomas forgot a place to plug his stuff. He forgot to say, where what? can people support his endeavors? <gasps> support my yes. what? And what, what are we talking about? Don't you have a Patreon? 
I do, but I don't tend to plug it on other people's podcasts. I think it's pretty rude. <laughs> so I don't No, no go not. right ahead. It's, it's not. not. We actually prompt people to because we support oh, okay. podcasters if and you, content. Okay. If you if you think this was good and you want to give me money, <laughs> <laughs> you can do that. Um, I do have a Patreon. Uh, it's, again, History of Aotearoa New Zealand podcast. Aotearoa spelled A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. People give me money sometimes for things. Um, mostly at the I moment. Think you're on YouTube it's... now too, right? <laughs> I am on YouTube. <laughs> I keep forgetting about the YouTube. The YouTube does have some uh, some videos of me going to Picton and looking at Cap- a replica of Captain Cook's ship, amongst other things. Um, so that's and right, you can watch Thomas. Here. So there is that. You can watch me, actually. You are right. Um, but I do also have a Patreon, um, which has um, uh, a few, uh, like, special episodes where i talk about new zealand animals um particularly birds but things like weta which is a bug and that kind of stuff um again because i've got a conservation and zoology background um we've also started a thing on um you know watching new zealand films and reviewing them with my brother um that's cool which, yeah we, we we i still we have been a bit slack recently and i haven't gotten around to doing the last one that i promised i would do so i do apologize for that if any of my patrons are listening yeah i'm i'm on it <laughs> just it's uh it's just it's been a bit it's been a bit hectic the last couple of months um but it will happen um but yeah so i do things like that um but yeah in general yeah the, the, if you want to give me money for that you you can for as little as a dollar a month if you just think I'm worth a dollar, you can support Thomas. You can support. You can support me for as little as a dollar for doing this. <laughs> so yeah, but yeah, there is that. If you um, if you listen to think this and think, man, that guy's a good bastard. I want to throw my hard-earned money at him, which I don't know why you'd think that, but there's enough people that do that. Um, you know, that that's like they're on Patreon. So yeah, he has merch as well. I do have yeah. merch. I have t-shirts and stuff. Um, one with a butterfly on it. One's with just the logo on it um, of the Tuatara, um, which is a native New Zealand reptile. Um, so, yeah. So, if you want to wear stuff, you can get face masks with the Tuatara on it. Um, if you're that way inclined. That's you need that. <laughs> so, there is, there is that. Um, but, yeah, if you want to buy that stuff, you can. It all, it all helps. Perfect. Yeah. So I think, yes, Kara. <laughs> There's other things I forgot to plug. So Jessica is in the process of redoing the Body Count website. So that will be up and running soon. You can listen to the existing episodes on there at current. Um, but there are some pretty exciting things coming up with that. So please keep, you know, again, by the time this is released, this may be a moot point, but. You can check out that website and you can also support Body Count Pod on Patreon as well for as little as a dollar. So I want to go ahead and add that in there. And one more housekeeping thing. If you enjoy any independent podcaster, any podcaster, please, please, and this includes us here, go on to Apple Podcasts and rate and review. Um, And I mean that sincerely because one of the few metrics that does not cost money Um, to support somebody that you enjoy listening to is by reviewing that to get anywhere in the algorithm, it truly helps. So if you enjoy us and what we do, please rate and review. Even if it's a few words, like we love Jessica's bullshit. Hell we'll take that. Um, I will take that. I think honestly, I think Thomas would say the same for his podcast. Like if you enjoy what Thomas does, go and rate and review his show, go and subscribe to his show. Even if you don't, tell me I'm shit, and the algorithm still puts me out. You're shit. Give me, give me a one star. Well, give me a one star review and tell me I'm shit. The algorithm still, still likes that. So, (laughs) but yeah. yeah. Well, they like. I know the one star and the five star are apparently the only things that mean anything in this algorithm for whatever reason. But um, you can also do that on Podchaser as well. Um, I'm not. Are you guys clear on if there's anywhere else you can really? I guess the only thing else I could think of is if you enjoy an episode of a show such as this, like if you're listening to this and I was like, you know what, that's, that's some pretty good stuff. Share it on Twitter. I will tell you again, that's another easy way you can support podcasters because 
this is, you know, this is something we're passionate about. These are, I can speak for all of us here when I say this is not our full-time day job. So we, anytime we see people reacting or quote tweeting or retweeting or commenting, even if it's simple as, hey, enjoyed this episode, that is nice to hear, I think, for any podcaster out there. And it's cool because you can interact with us. We like to talk to mm. people on Twitter. And I think any podcaster will say it's always nice to hear um, from fans. So I just wanted to throw that spiel out there because if you're like, okay, well, I can't support on Patreon. What can I do? Seriously, rate and review and or share episodes you like on any social media platform. And we would be very grateful. So with that being said, Thomas, we are so, so very grateful for you for saying yes to this project, maybe not knowing at the time how much work it was going to be involved. I, but I always I always do that. I always just say yes and go, yeah, she'll be right. Uh, and well, then... to be fair, that's Jessica <laughs> with Nancy Wake, right? She was like, okay, this is going to be like a one-part situation. And then mm. inevitably it becomes a multi-part. But I honestly think that's for a lot of our listeners. We love those stories. Um, having transitioned yeah. from being a listener to a co-host, that's one of the things I do like is a narrative story. So seriously, thank you. And I am very excited for part two. And I think anybody listening will be like, God damn it, where is it? So um, awesome. Yeah, yeah no, thank you very much again for, for having me. It's, as I said, it's always cool to be able to, to talk about these kind of things because, you know, not a lot of people know about, um, you know, people like Malone or anything like that. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Awesome. Well, that will do it for us this week. Thomas will be back with part two. Next week, I'll have to come up with some kind of clever title, but I'm sure it'll be in there. Um, that being said, thank you, guys. Thank you, Thomas. We will see you next week, or you'll hear us, rather. Bye. Bye.